you went under the wheels. How affected. Welcome to Under the Wheels. I'm Matthew. I'm Gabe. And today we are going to talk about Death Stranding. Coronavirus. Corru- well, Death yeah. Stranding. <laughs> 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 We're going to talk about what happens after the, the, the coronavirus strand, the EE that is the coronavirus occurs on our the, planet. No, the, the coronavirus is just the, uh, like the initial thing. The EE is the toilet paper epidemic. <laughs> we'll be fighting giant like monsters made out of toilet paper. <laughs> Should we just get? Should we just like announce spoilers immediately so we can make jokes about it? Oh yeah, we're gonna be spoiling the entirety of Death Stranding later on in the podcast once we get past like you know the usual like what have you been watching lately and stuff. Oh, um, I was ready to spoil it right now with a really bad joke, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I think after I think after the what have you been watching, we'll uh, we'll just like take the reins off of it and you can learn all about who is Sam Porter, Norman Reedus Bridges. I know. I'm kind of curious. AMC show Hold Ride. on one second, because I want to see like how many people have don't like Death Stranding. The game. Well, no, oh. have gotten to the end because part of it's like you know, it, there's. I'm sure there's like a lot because like, you can always check the the trophies. So let's see. I'm like partially curious as well, but it it's weird because it feels like a game that you really can kind of almost complete it at any point as long as you don't care about some of like the superfluous elements of it Mm -hmm. because i mean how many five star locations did you get in the course of trying to beat the game zero (laughs) i didn't five star any locations did you get any location above three stars yeah i got a few to like four stars okay i i started doing it just for like the upgraded items because i was like fuck this shit (laughs) is there like a way i can look up without having to log on to my playstation like Not what the completion I... rate is. <laughs> Just like open up PlayStation mid podcast. Dome. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, not that I know of. Oh, here we go. PSNprofiles.com slash trophies. Let's take a look. <laughs> oh, it says uh fifty percent of people have uh completed episode fourteen. So okay. wait, hold on. No, actually uh thirty percent. Thirty percent? Wow. Yeah. Uh, to put it into perspective, how many people have completed Red Dead Redemption? I'm pretty sure everyone who's played it has completed it. <laughs> unless they're like, I don't know, offended by it or something. <laughs> I don't or know. Or they I... got tired of leaping off their horse to like guns a blazing only to find out after the fact that all their items are still on their horse <laughs> and that they only have their revolver. I assume we're talking about Red Dead Redemption 2, not yes. 1, right? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. I- I'm guessing that happened to you multiple times through your playthroughs, Gabe. Dude, I fucking hated that. Like, okay, Red Dead Redemption <laughs> 2 is an amazing game, but it's way too realistic, all right? I do not want to have to, like, like a gunfight has started, scramble for your life, and then, like, hold on, let me get off my horse, cycle through my horse's saddlebag to get out all the guns I'm going to need and all the items I'm going to need for this. I just want to the... be, like, RDR1, where I leap off the horse, do a dive roll on the ground. I have, like, a shotgun hidden in my, my jeans pocket. And, <laughs> like, everything I need is just there. I don't have to be like, oh, shit, I forgot my shotgun on my horse, which is now run away because it's scared of gunfire. Like... <laughs> <laughs> that brings up a whole nother argument about, like... So now I'm how... cowering behind a log, whistling, <laughs> so I can get my shotgun. Like, trot over to you while it's getting, like... <laughs> Blown the shit out by gunfire. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I haven't played Red Dead Redemption 2 yet, so... <laughs> All of that stuff is foreign to me. I heard, like, they're like, oh, yeah, you got to take, like, warming yourself up really seriously and, like, the survival elements. And I was like, oh, my God. Oh, yeah, you can, like, freeze death to stranding. death in that game. Yeah, yeah. In this, you like... can go into autotaxemia, but... Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. What have you been watching lately, Matt? I was uh, in the process of rewatching Haywire. Mm. Um, I'm I'm right near the end. I, is it safe to say that we both like Steven Soderbergh as a director? I think it's safe to say that. Like, it, on a scale of like, like if you gave him an Under the Wheels rating, what kind of rating would you give him as a director? <sighs> That's tough because like I think the limey is like perfect in every way, or at least <laughs> almost perfect in every way, but. 
because he's so like all over the place. Probably yeah, with he this. is. But I mean, that's the thing I like about him is he's he he's Mister Not Boring. Whatever he does, it's not boring, even if it's terrible. <laughs> so he has to be like a witness. Like he's the definition of a witness. Like you have to see everything he does just because it'll be interesting. Yeah, I would say he's definitely like a solid witness just because, like you said, he's all over the place. And like he, I mean, it feels like with Ocean's Eleven, he almost brought back the heist movie. Oh, God. Really Ocean's Eleven anywhere. is another movie that's like almost perfect in every way. Oh yeah, I think I've watched. I, I think I watched it like twice in one day, one time. It's he did Out place. of Sight as well, right? Yep, he did Out Dude, of Sight. Out of Sight has pr- my favorite bank robbery scene of all time. The opening. Yeah, like so George good. Clooney just walks in with a nice suit and like talks a guy into. Th- like he convinces someone that he's robbing a bank and that's how he robs the bank yep. and it's genius it's so good and um it's funny because uh what's his name michael Ke- the only reason michael keaton is in the movie is because because he was in jackie brown right it, yep that's exactly <laughs> right and Tar- i think tarantino and soderbergh had like an agreement in order to bridge the two movies together mm-hmm. that michael keaton was going to be the uh the nick fury of the of the the franchise that universe that never was it's he's the fuck what's the name of that author who wrote like rum punch and out of oh, sight and i know those. i was trying to think of his name um like he's the nick fury of the rum punch verse the... <laughs> <laughs> who wrote out of sight elmer leonard <laughs> elmer the... leonard that's right he's the, he's the nick fury of the elmer, elmer leonard, leonard cinematic, cinematic universe, universe. <laughs> It's a shame, though, that it's him and not Max Cherry, because I like um, Robert Forrester. I do, too, but I also like Michael Keaton, and he's kind of an asshole in both of them, so it's kind of, like, fitting. <laughs> it's funny, because, like, in, in Jackie Brown, he's, like, kind of a jerk, but he's, like, a very competent policeman and stuff. Yeah. And then in, <laughs> in Out of Sight, he's just, like, the just giant dumbass. <laughs> <laughs> but it's weird because I think the character appears in both books, in Rum Punch and in Out of Sight. He's like a recurring huh. character, that's so that's why they wanted him in there. Because they're like, oh well, you don't want we don't want you to recast this character. We want you hmm. to have Michael Keaton in there. But you know, different screenwriters, different yeah. directors, you know. But yeah, cause, hey, so yeah, Steven Soderbergh has made so many almost perfect movies. Yeah, but he's also made, he's made like the like, Informant. I know that's the thing. He's made the Informant. He's made Side Effects. He made that one movie where, like, he plays himself and all his lines are not lines, but, like, cues. Yeah, I, I, it's like, uh, is, uh, oh, I don't remember, because I know he also did, I think it's called, like, no, it's not Full Frontal, that's a different movie. There was one that he did that was, like, uh, untru- I don't know, B- between, like, right before Out of Sight, he had a mm-hmm. string of, like, five movies that he wrote that did nothing, just completely collapsed before he did out of sight he did out of shite (laughs) he ran out of shite (laughs) well he stopped writing his own movies that was Mm. the huge thing it's like when he did out of sight they kind of like took a they took a a risk on him oh schizopolis was that schizopolis yep that's the one he also and then like he came one year he came super strong where he did traffic and aaron brockovich released in the same year both nominated for best director and both nominated for best picture Mm mm-hmm like he's he is nuts and he did uh, a tv show a couple of years ago like after he had quote retired after like behind the candelabra or whatever he retired mm-hmm. and did a tv show where he shot every episode mm-hmm. and edited every episode <laughs> like, it's quite a retirement <laughs> <laughs> well retired from film and then he came back with logan lucky and you know you know what how we feel about logan well yeah yeah we both the movie's great seen, i love yeah, logan lucky okay. Um, I was going to say, because Logan Lucky, that was another one where, like, no one knows who the screenwriter is, and so they just kind of assume that he had something to do with the writing of the movie. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's 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 a weird guy. And that's why Haywire is so weird, because it's, like, him doing an action movie, but, like, doing it in his own style. So, like, there's a sequence that's, like, a shootout, but there's no sound except for, like, super drowned out gunfire. Hmm. And, like, his he likes casting a lot of his friends in like cameo roles like ewan mcgregor's in there and michael douglas have you seen haywire no i have not okay so it's it's really weird because it's got like a ton of the like channing tatum is in it which is i think where they first met and first started working together was haywire 
Mm -hmm. And then he'd go on to like Magic Mike and side effects and all these other stuff. By the way, he did he directed Magic Mike, which is weird too. I know. Um, but it's it. There's a certain level of like uh, Steven Soderbergh just like picks a project, gets his crew together, which is mainly just you know himself because he shoots and edits his own movies at a certain point. <laughs> um, and then he's just like, yeah, I'm just gonna do my best to like try and make this movie and. Like, it's kind of cool, because a lot of the fight scenes use mixed martial arts techniques in it. Huh. Um, yeah. Isn't and Michael Fassbender has a fight scene. Michael Fassbender's in it, too. Um, <laughs> He's also and, interesting in that he seems to cast a lot of, like, non-actors in leads. Right. Or, or people who, like, not normally seen as acting, and then go on to have some sort of a career in acting. Because, like, mm-hmm. I don't think Gina Serrano would have had... Gina Carano? I think it's Carano. Gina Carano, I don't think she would have had any sort of acting career if it weren't for Haywire. Wait, what? According to Wikipedia, he's the second unit director for The Hunger Games. What? Yeah, I don't... Like, I'm just as confused as you are. <laughs> I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense. Why didn't they just get him to do The Hunger Games? Because it, was, it had to be directed by Gary Ross. Yeah, of course. You know, naturally. The guy who ends up directing Ocean's 8. <laughs> like... Six degrees of separation there. But yeah. It, it's it, like one degree of separation that's just <laughs> doubling back on itself over and over. Well, like, the other thing is that Soderbergh does, it, like, after... I forgot which movie. I know that starting with... Um, I guess it was starting with Traffic. He started really doing his own camera work. Like, he did for his first couple movies. Then took mm-hmm. a break, and someone else was doing camera work and editing and stuff like that. And then he started doing all of his cam- his own camera work. And then, like, midway through the 2000s, he started doing all of his own editing as well. So, like, <laughs> that's why, like, in Magic Mike, he's the cinematographer and the editor. But he's yeah. not the director for some reason. Which is, like, <laughs> like I don't, he's such a weird guy. And Haywire is such a weird action movie. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's pretty good. Like, I, I'm enjoying it. It's got, like, a really weird chase scene that doesn't go anywhere. But it's, like... If you're while you're watching it, you're like, oh yeah, this is a very Soderberghy moment. Like, there's a lot yeah. of those in there. Well, it's like the laundromat is not a great movie or even a very good movie, but it's a very interesting movie. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like that's the thing you can say. Like all his duds and all his disasters are still really interesting. Yeah. And then like his successes are like amazing. <laughs> yeah, I mean like traffic is still incredible although he has this weird thing where he like over tints all of his movies like Hmm. like it was purposefully done on traffic so you can keep track of your of the stories but like every other movie i've watched it's like hey this scene takes place indoors it's nothing but yellow hey this scene takes place outdoors it's all blue it's like all right man maybe like tone down some of like the overdone color stuff (laughs) but but as but like per usual his movies are always really stylish which is cool Mm mm-hmm Definitely. But yeah, that's the main one I've been watching. Okay. What about you? What have you been up to? Um, let's see. I watched a couple horror movies recently. I watched Phantasm, which is like an old 70s like cult horror movie. Yeah. That's interesting. It's, it's pretty good. It's pretty strange as well. And it's also pretty like, it's got that kind of 70s low budget horror movie cornball feel going <laughs> as well. But like, there's some really cool stuff that they were old able to pull off with like no money like there's this metal orb that attacks people and the way mm-hmm. it kills people is so fucking disgusting <laughs> like what do they actually show what it does is it like a stop motion animation or something i don't know how they did it but i have i have the i have a book i have like the autobiography of the guy who wrote directed edited and did the special effects for that movie oh my um, god as well as bubba hotep among others, um, Don Coscarelli. I don't, so it, I'll probably get to a certain point in that book about how he created the orb, but the orb is like a thing. It's like the size of like a softball. Okay. Um, and it's all like cr- shiny and chrome. And um, <laughs> it has like these two knives that come out of it and it just flies through the air at like insane speeds. And it like hits this guy in the face, the two knives go into his eyes, and then like out of the center, there's a drill that drills into his head. And then out of the back, yeah, and then out of the back, a hole opens up, and all this blood just sprays out like out of a fire hose. Out of the orb? 
Out of the orb, yeah, like oh it's draining all the blood from his face and shooting it out the back. Oh my god, dude. It's horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually pretty amazing. It is pretty amazing. Like that like that it's one of the most impressive like special effects I've I've seen in a movie of that era or just in general. <laughs> so yeah, like it's a solid, you know, it's like a solid witness, I'd say. Yeah. I watched Jacob's Ladder as well, which has some interesting like stylistic quirks to it, but the end it's got one of those like it was all a dream type of endings. Oh. That's so insanely frustrating. I don't like the movie because of it. <laughs> hey, man, your ending is important. I, I know one, more than one person who was di disappointed by us because of the ending, including myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, then, like, you got to stick the landing. I know. And then I watched the, uh, the available episodes of uh, Gendy Tartakovsky's Primal. Yeah. Dude, that show is amazing. <laughs> It's so good. I'm like bummed though, because like at the end of episode five, there's like a cliffhanger, and um, like I need it resolved now. <laughs> I mean, I'm you pretty mean, sure I know how it's gonna get resolved, but that show is so brutal, you just never know. You mean director of Hotel Transylvania one, two, and threes, Gendy Tartakovsky? Yes, that Gendy Tartakovsky. <laughs> um, I yeah, I, I should watch Primal. I never, I never got into Samurai Jack as much as I wanted to. Uh, and like if if primal's only like four or five episodes in it's like you know i could probably yeah you know, it'll knock them out quickly it'll take you two hours to watch all five yeah are they um, are they all half hour or like 20 minutes they're all 20 minutes okay um and they're all yeah they're all very good there's no dialogue in the whole show nice. so it's all like visual and suggestive storytelling which is pretty yeah. cool um and it's all like super stylized and over the top, which is great. Yeah, of course. It's, it's weird because like I, I saw some of the clips to the new Samurai Jack where they're using like, you know, digitally painted backgrounds and lighting mm -hmm. effects and stuff. And you contrast that with like the first season's four by three aspect ratio, <laughs> no budget. And I, I was know. like, I was like, oh man, I know I should go back and rewatch the original, but oh, it's going to be rough. In I a mean, way that's some other anime isn't rough. There's just something about like I don't know, man. <laughs> well, it's, know, like, it's interesting because yeah, you go back and watch like the first episode of Samurai Jack, and like the lines are a lot less clean than you remember. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because like they're just you know it's the the technology of that time, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and how all those drawings got recorded, but you know, I'm sure I'm sure we will get hopefully like some sort of HD. Like the 4K HD remastering, remastered like Samurai all Jack five Kai. seasons of Samurai Jack, yeah, <laughs> that'd be cool. But again, Just it was on like Blu -ray. it's like or it H was HD DVD, <laughs> HD DVD. No, I mean like a 4K Blu-ray or whatever. The, yeah. the the super deluxe Blu-ray. Yeah, or just like released on Amazon Prime in 4K mode that you can't access <laughs> that. On, that I can't access on my PlayStation because it doesn't do 4K. <laughs> um. Yeah, it's Sam, yeah, Jendi Tartakovsky. He's got he's got like a wild and interesting career because I never I didn't watch Symbionic Command uh, Sim, the Symbionic show Titan. He, yes, I never watched that, and I heard that was just kind of okay. It is just kind of okay. I watched yeah. the first like maybe ten episodes or so, um, yeah. and it, yeah, it's it's all right. I, you um, know, like but like every he does, other show he's done has been amazing. Like Dexter's Lab was Dexter's amazing. Lab, awesome. Yeah. Uh, Samurai Jack is amazing. Star yeah. Wars: The Clone Wars is amazing. Mm hmm. Um, but it's also like it's funny because I, I make fun of the fact that he did like the Hotel Transylvania movies, which like <laughs> in some ways seem like you know an easy cash out. But if he doesn't do those, you don't get prime. You don't get the latter half. You don't get a remake of Samurai Jack. You know you don't. Yeah. It's, what is it? Prime Primal. Well, Primal is because of the success of the Samurai Jack. I, I mean that that helps, but like also he has money to like keep doing his projects. Yeah. You know, like he well, he had the money to do Samurai Jack. Apparently, he genuinely enjoys, like, Hotel Transylvania. I haven't watched any of them, but every, like, every Hotel Transylvania movie, he it gets more and more, like, Jendi Tartakovsky looking. Like, the way that they do the key poses and stuff. Yeah. Like, even I can though see I that. Like, I, found, I find some of the... Like, it's just weird that it's CG. Mm -hmm. If it were all flat, it would all look... Right, but there's something about like they're in they're in 3D that's kind of just a little bit off. But every movie looks more and more like his style. Yeah, it's it's really crazy. 
But again, I haven't. I, I shouldn't judge them because I haven't seen them. They just seem kind of like easy cash-ins. Yeah, well, because someone... People have asked him about that. It's like, are you just doing those for the money? Like, you know... Because, you know, they know Samurai Jack was canceled. A lot of his shows get canceled. Yeah. Um, so he's like, you know, are, people are asking, like, do you, you know, like, are you just doing those for the money? Are you struggling financially? Blah, blah, blah. And he's like, no, I really like Hotel Transylvania. They're a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I guess the other way to look at it is like, you know, like Adam Sandler gets flack, but like he gets to hang out with Adam Sandler for a couple of days while they record. He gets to hang out with Steve Buscemi. You know, mm-hmm. he gets to hang out with Andy Samberg. And so, like, they're probably a lot of fun to hang out with. I mean, there's a reason Adam Sandler gets his, like, cadre of friends together yeah. every time he wants to shoot a movie. Like, they might not yeah, be for me. there's people who are like that. Yeah. You know, and it's like, well, it's like, it's like how all those Kevin James movies are terrible. Right. But, like, all of Kevin James's friends who are never in movies will just be in his movies because, like, he's a fun guy to hang out with. Yeah. And they get paid. <laughs> Well, I, a lot of them don't need the money, though. Yeah. I'm yeah, sure. Some, yeah. Like, I yeah. think there was some thing where it's, like, almost all the movies that Joe Rogan appears in are, like, Kevin J- are like shitty Kevin James comedies. But he, And the only reason he does that is just because he really likes Kevin James. <laughs> like, good buddies. <laughs> it's so weird. Like, but, like, I, but I can see, like, Bill Romanowski keeps appearing in Adam Sandler movies. Yeah, exactly. He's like, yeah, I know they're bad, but, you know, he invited me to do it. And, you know, there's a He's reason. A good guy. That, yeah, like... So it's weird because I know like we like to shit on them and like it's you know but it's kind of funny that he's taking the studio for all it's worth in its own way. <laughs> well, it's kind of like you know when when you're in school and you're make you're just making silly movies with your friends. There, as much as Adam Sandler's movies are crap, like it's kind of cool that he's able to do that on like a huge budget <laughs> scale with yeah. like studio money. Yeah. It's just like, oh, yeah, I'm going to get my friends together. We're going to make a silly movie. <laughs> yeah. It's, like, it's incredible. The the economy of Adam Sandler movies. I know. Speaking of getting your friends together and making a silly movie, the last movie I saw uh, prior to this podcast is Federico Fellini's Eight and a Half. Ooh. Uh, Man. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wait, don't you mean the movie Nine? What? <laughs> Are you rounding up? <laughs> no. <laughs> there was a um, there's a the musical starring Daniel Day Lewis, directed yeah. by Rob Marshall. Back when Rob Marshall was a prestige director and not just like a not just like doing movies for Disney to make sure that he could pay for his bungalow in New York. <laughs> a New York bungalow? I've never heard it's, of that. Yeah, something like that. I thought that was you an know. LA thing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, his th- fine, his third bungalow in L.A., so he can commute back and forth between New York and L.A. Um, but, eight and yeah, a half. Eight and a Half is really good. Like, it's really, it's, it's ultra stylish. It, there's a lot of interesting things cinematically, and it's also, like, I mean, it's, like, the most meta movie ever. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it mines that meta-ness for humor in a lot of ways. Like, it, there's a lot of comedy in the movie that's, like, sort of, self-deprecating where it's like there will be some sort of extravagant artistic cinematic sequence and then there's like this critic who's like like reading the guy's script for the movie that he's trying to make which is also the movie that we're watching and he's like this is a bunch of bullshit you're just like being pretentious and showing off because you think like you know people will think it's cool <laughs> he's like you know like this character doesn't make any sense like it you know it's like he keeps like attacking the, the director for being like pretentious and self-obsessed which i thought was really funny and he always does it right after there's like a really you know surreal artsy moment <laughs> So the thing about like the because I guess it's it still technically fell under neorealist movies in Italian film. It, no, it's not. It's I know not it's. At all. I know it's, it's surrealist. Stylist. It's considered a surrealist movie, not a neo a neorealist movie. Okay, but he still uses some of those techniques. Like a lot of the dialogue is like ADR'd and like ADR'd like not necessarily perfectly. Oh, it's if ADR'd like badly. <laughs> yeah, like that for whatever it's reason weird too, because like. A lot of it's ADR'd in people, by people who are clearly not Italian speaking Italian. Oh, really? Yeah, like, there's sequences that are ADR'd where, like, someone will be talking, 
and their voice, like everything they're saying is in Italian. I think the movie right. switches off between Italian, French, and English, but it's mostly Italian. They'll be speaking in Italian, but it it's like Italian spoken with a British accent. <laughs> So there's I don't have enough saying, money in, Ita- in Italy to finish it. Let me go to Britain. They love my movies. <laughs> yeah, because like someone would be like, Buongiorno Guido. But instead of saying it, it's like, like Buongiorno Guido. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, like how, what the fuck? Maybe it's like, like you, how, couldn't, you couldn't go get ahead. an Italian person to dub this considering it's being dubbed anyway. <clears throat> I mean, I wonder if it's like how in American movies, like when two Russians are talking to each other, they just it's like all in English. They they talk in English but with Russian accents. Yeah. And you're like, oh, like like in Wonder Woman, like all of a sudden, what's his name? Chris Pine's talking with a German accent, but he's still speaking in English, and it's like, oh yeah, <laughs> I'm speaking I guess he's German. Turning, I guess he's speaking German now. Like maybe it's a similar thing there of like, or it's like a character who's supposed to be British in the world speaking Italian, so they give him a British accent. I don't know. <clears throat> maybe. I mean, the best version of that is in Die Hard when Hans Gruber says something in German to another German guy, and then the German guy doesn't understand it, so he <laughs> says it in English, and the guy understands it. Audience shorthand. I know, he's like, he's like, schnell, schnell, and the guy's like, huh? And he's just huh? like, go, hurry. <laughs> and it's like, what? No, but he's German, he would understand it better if it was, a G- you fuck. <laughs> <laughs> this movie makes no sense anymore. Um, I just assume that Federico Fellini looks like the guy you that, get. That's the real reason why John McTiernan went to jail. But <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> that was his cry. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, John McTiernan humor. Uh, I thought it was because he made the 13th Warrior. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I always just think that the guy who plays as the main character in Eight and a Half, like Marcello Mastroianni. Yes, that actor. I just assume that that's what Federico Fellini looks like, which I know is like not true at all. <laughs> not even remotely true. Because isn't that guy Fellini is... like super huge? Oh yeah, Fellini looks like a toad. <laughs> <laughs> like, like imagine a like liver spotted Alfred Hitchcock with like Henry Kissinger hair, and that's. <laughs> Federico Fellini. He just kind of looks like an Italian Henry Kissinger, if I'm going to be honest. <laughs> but Marcello so, Mastroianni is so very, good. like, stylish, and, yeah. you know, he's like a good-looking dude. He doesn't yeah. look anything like Fellini. <laughs> but Eight and a Half, worth the watch. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's a really good movie. Um, nice. It's, especially if you're just, like, a movie geek right there's a lot of cool sequences a lot of cool ideas a lot of great special effects and a lot of great humor i mean it obviously like it is a surrealist movie so it can be kind of alienating to certain people who aren't into that type of yeah. type of thing but you know i i really enjoyed it i thought it was very good well it's another like i, I haven't seen a lot of it i think I've, i saw the first half hour of it and yeah. I was into it, but I had to move on to something else at the time. But, like, <laughs> just th- there are moments in there where it's just, like, there's something about the way that uh, certain foreign directors use the camera where it feels like they're just, like, all right, this is what we're going to go do in the scene. Hand me the camera and let's shoot it quickly. Like, there's, yeah, you know, that that always, Which like, like. It, 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 it makes me want to go out there and make something. Like, there's, know, a, like, an does, energy to right? it. So And it's kind of the same with Godard, even though, like, I understand... I, even though I don't know if I'd ever really be able to watch some of his more abstract later stuff. <laughs> Canon Films presents John Goddard's <laughs> King Lear. <laughs> <laughs> Which is always going to be the high point. I know. Um, nice. Did you see anything else? Uh, just those. Well, not that that wasn't a lot. Cause that's, yeah. You, know, you, you kind of ran the gamut there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, and now, and also a lot of my time has been spent trying to, like, uh, finish, you know, Death Stranding, so we can talk about it here and now. Yeah, exactly. That's that's what ended up sucking up a lot of my time, <laughs> bits and pieces here and there. So let's do it, dude. Let's talk about Death Stranding. I'm, I'm really excited. I've been looking forward to this since you were like, hey, man, we should probably talk about it on the podcast. Yeah. And I was still on, like, chapter <clears throat> six or something. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> well, fuck. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Um... 
Death Stranding starring Norman Reedus, Leia Sado. Sado? Sado? Sado. Sado. Two versions of Lindsay Wagner, um, Troy Baker, and featuring Guillermo del Toro <laughs> <laughs> as Dead Man and Nicholas Winding Refn as Hartman. Yep. And also Margaret Qualley's poorly Margaret- animated teeth. I, I felt so bad because I was like, out of all of the things to like accurately represent in the game, we're going to make sure that your teeth are 100% real to who you are right now. It's I like, know. Oh my gosh. When she, there's like that scene where it's her flashback and she's trapped under the rubble. <laughs> like that was so unsettling the way her face gets animated because her teeth are like too, like her, like her face is a video game face, but her teeth are in the uncanny valley. <laughs> like being ultra realistic. <laughs> yeah, so I'm um, like, ah, I don't know how I feel about this. <laughs> I just, I like, you know, commitment to like 100% accuracy and everything. But like, you know, good for Margaret Qualley for like doing this. Cause like, I know. It's such a weird choice. Like, good for all the actors doing it, even though I know Norman Reedus and Norman Reedus's digital ass was like, the first thing that was greenlit about this project. <laughs> My God. Dude. And also, you know, we've complained so much in the past about Mads Mikkelsen being underutilized in movies. Yeah. He, this has perfectly utilized him, I think. I know. I, I could have... Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So let's... Let, where, where should we start with the game? Did you like the game? Yes. I like the game quite a bit. All right. Where does it stack for you? <coughs> I, liked, I liked the game a lot. I think out of the mm-hmm. last, out of the last maybe like five or ten years, this has been one of the best games I've played. Wow. Yeah. I don't know if I go quite that far. It's definitely the best game I've played of 2019. I would agree I with that. that. I mean, I didn't play that many games in 2019. I love Neither Borderlands. Did I. <laughs> I like I love Borderlands, so I played the fuck out of Borderlands Three, but I like Death Stranding a little bit more. The, for di- and obviously for very different reasons. Right, um, right. Where do you think this fits in with Kojima's oeuvre? Especially considering that, I mean, games do not typically age very well. So you kind yeah. of have to compare, like, you playing this right now compared to how you played other games and how you felt about them at that time in the past. Well, so I, I, I played Metal Gear Solid... Technically, I didn't play the first one on PlayStation. I played the Twin Snakes. So I've played Twin mm. Snakes 2, 3, and 4 all the way to completion. I stayed away from 5 because a lot of people were telling me it was an incomplete game. And I could even venture that Death Stranding may feel a little incomplete in some areas. I don't know how much I love his open world stuff just because I'm used to you know, Metal Gear Solid 1, 2, 3, and 4, which had kind of open-worldy elements, but were pretty strict. No, they weren't, they were not even open-world. They were like... Well, they, they did, but they did have areas, like, you could they go just, back in areas and, like, do, yeah, like, Yeah, they were just, they were, stuff. they were levels. They were, like, classical levels, but just big. Well, they were, but, like, but again, like, you could go back, like, in Metal Gear Solid 1, there's no point, there's no part in the game until the very end where you couldn't go all the way back to the first area you know what i yeah. mean like so it's but you're not like inside a building world, the whole time but yeah yeah but it's the same <clears throat> with like two and three like three is getting to the point where it's like oh now you're outdoors but each area it's not like one cohesive map it's all a bunch no. of smaller maps connected yeah um, exactly four kind of gets there because like especially chapter two takes forever which is another weird thing about like kojima has very strange pacing issues in all of his games mm-hmm. and he has an obsession with like dividing up his games into like first half is kind of like a prologue short area and then the second half is like the majority of the game and then like a yeah. little tiny sprinkling for a third act i was gonna say um, i feel like a lot of um especially games from japan and europe to a lesser extent have that where it's like there's a there's a prologue world almost that takes a while to get through and then there's the game proper like the right. witcher 3 for example is kind of like that where there's there's a pretty lengthy section that is more basically just the prologue and it takes place in a, a small area and then once you're done with that you get to the actual game so i i also say that i'm not as big a fan of of like american video games as i am of japanese games 
Mm -hmm. Just because I, I think there's like a, a really weird design philosophy difference between the two. Yeah. Um, and so I, I tend to like the feel of Japanese games better. Now, with that said, I haven't played The Witcher 3. Um, I haven't played Red Dead Redemption 2, both games that I think I'd like a lot. Well, I The Witcher played... 3 is a Polish game. Right. Yeah. I, 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 don't, I, I would still kind of count it out as, as Western, but, I, but that's why I was saying like American-made games. Like I yeah, do generally yeah. like rockstar games but even those like there's still like on oh, rockstar from scotland element. are they really yeah well so the the original rockstar unit that made grand theft auto and continues to make all the grand theft auto games is scottish oh my um, god yeah like the original grand theft auto was a scottish satire of american culture <laughs> oh that's so perfect um See, but the red dead it... redemption games are made in the u.s they're made out of san diego Okay, so they're Rockstar San Diego. So, like, I, I'm also a big fan of Kojima games. Like, I mm -hmm. played a bit of Boktai. I want to go back and play Snatchers. I like Police Knots. I played both of the Zone of the Enders games. So, like, I'm a fan. Mm -hmm. um, so, I'm biased. So, everything I say, go ahead and take with a grain of salt or whatever yeah. um, about Death Stranding. But I, I was really looking forward to it. I had a really good time with it. Um, I don't know if I would go back to it just because that beginning section, not, not like the prologue and getting into it, but like probably from like before you get the first bike onwards, before you can like mass produce bikes, it's, it's good. It's going to be hard for me to like go back and play up to that point again. Oh yeah. Like the, my biggest beef with Death Stranding is that the prologue is so uninteresting and it's really, when you get to chapter three and it starts to introduce more of the social elements and stuff. Right. That's when the game really becomes a lot of fun because I think like the main allure of the game and what makes it different from a lot of other games is kind of the social aspect of it where you are on your own, but you know, there's this kind of like you put good things out into the world of the game and good things come back to you, right. you know? And it's, it's kind of like you have that feeling of being part of a community where you're, you know, the world is totally empty with the exception of uh, BTs and um, human enemies, the mules, yeah. who are addicted to the thrill of delivering packages. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just Jeff Bezos bonkers, is going to but... use that like over every Amazon corporate office, like, be the mule you need to be. I know. Be addicted um, to the delivery. <laughs> But so like the world is empty basically and it kind of, it's kind of cool that feeling of like you and all these people you don't know are like working together to repopulate it like mm -hmm. building roads and building equipment to like help each other out because like the world is pretty big on foot but spoilers or minor spoilers one of the final missions of the game is you have to start at one end of you have to start at the very end of the map and go all the way back to the beginning. The, the, like cover all of the area you've spent the entire game yep. covering in one go. And going back is really, really fast uh, because you have all the things that you've built and that other people have built to help ease the way. And I think that's like, I thought that was really cool. Like in a game that is about kind of connection and people helping each other out, like going one direction for most of the game is like an arduous task. But when mm -hmm. you have to go back, it's really easy because all your work and the work of other people is paid off. Yeah, it's funny because a lot of people were kind of like, like in the, it, for example, in the video I sent you, he was kind of bitching and moaning about how like, um, it's like you want to have this amazing moment of like seeing all of the places that you've gone to and all of the great things that you've done and like seeing how far you've come. But it goes by in such a blink of, the, of an eye that like you don't really think about it. Like, you can't really enjoy the fact that you've traversed all this land. And I was, like, I think you're probably the first person that I've talked to who's like, oh, I like the fact that, like, you can really see how much you've developed and how you can use all of the tools that you've already put in place in order to get back after that, like, after the chiral network's all established. Yeah. You can get back to it. So it's, it's funny because, like, I, I enjoyed it particularly also because, like, some I, I realized that I hadn't laid out some of my zip lines as well as I should have. <laughs> for some of the areas especially near the latter half of the game i didn't mm -hmm. i definitely could have redone my zip lines but i also like that there's like a giant highway that you're like slowly building that's it's kind of an optional thing but 
it makes the latter half of the game so much easier if you just pump all of your resources into it. Oh yeah, I pumped so many resources into building the highway like early on. Mm -hmm. And as a result, like you know, you have your stats of like how much cargo you can carry, how fast you run out of breath, yep, and all that. Dude, I got my bridge link to like 70 before yeah. the end of chapter <laughs> 4. Just because I was spent so much time building roads. So, like, everyone was on the roads I was building. And, like, they were contributing to it, too. Yep. And then, yeah, that and just shot really through cool. the roof. It's really cool. It's amazing. Like, I love that feature. Like, that's cool. Um, I remember from my zipline network, when I started making all my own ziplines, I used a lot of ones that already appeared. And, again, it's weird because the the items that appear in your game, you have some control over it because you can, like, like certain people. Yeah. But for the most part, if you don't choose anything, the game will randomly distribute a bunch of stuff. Yeah, which is which is kind of cool, but also it it can be kind of problematic. But it can you can also <laughs> like you can also like f move your things along that way. Also, I never felt like I was lacking any vehicles. Once they open up, like everyone else has a bunch of vehicles that the game will randomly drop in the world anyway. Yeah, which I found really helpful and really cool too. Oh, absolutely. Like, when you're in the middle of some un inhospitable hellhole, like, in the snow or on a mountain. Oh, God. Like, near a BT area, and, like, you can't get away because you're so slow moving in the snow. And there's just, like, a bike randomly there. And I'm like, oh, thank oh, you, thank guy God. who left this. <laughs> 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 um, my favorite were the uh, the the time fall shelters. I was like, oh, thank God. Oh, those were so <laughs> nice. Time, those and the, uh, the, the bunkers. Because the bunkers take so much resources to build. Like, oh, the people who just build those out of the kindness of their hearts yeah. are, are great. <laughs> You're just like, eh, I'll use a private room now. I actually... So, there, it, it's also kind of cool because, like, there are a lot of ways to play the game. And I think there's enough variety in how you can go about it that it's not too problematic. But I find it really weird that a lot of people... Like, I don't know if you did this, but apparently a lot of people complained because they would load up Sam so much. And then they'd be like, oh, no, I got to balance all my cargo. Oh, this is such a drag. Like, I did that maybe for the first, like, two hours of the game, and then I was like, or maybe I just make a lot of stops and use tools and vehicles in order to make my job easier. Like, yeah. were you I mean, were you overloading? By the end of the, eh, not really. I mean, by the end of the game, I could drive on literally any surface. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, I had figured out the tricks to, to taking your vehicle anywhere. Um, oh, so I could okay. I could just overload Sam, hop on the bike, and go. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! I never got too comfortable with the vehicles, but mm -hmm. um, there was uh, shit. Like I never really used trucks, for example. Yeah, I never used trucks either. Well, because uh, don't you have to get like don't you have to steal those from mules? Oh no! You can if you, there's a person you can you can unlock trucks to use. Oh, I guess I didn't game. like five star that person or whatever. Yeah, I, you have to get to like three or four stars with one of the other uh, with one of the other guys in order to get him um, oh well <laughs> in, in order to lose well and it was like it's funny because the other thing about the game is like um, oh, I was gonna, oh no I was gonna go back to something else but anyway the other interesting thing about like how it was is like you could do standard orders which I found kind of annoying but mm -hmm. you can also randomly just pick up packages for the people and deliver them and like the standard orders will give you the best likes yeah but um but if you chose not but if you chose to like pick up random packages you could also make like a cash fall just of likes that way too so i thought the dynamics of the game system itself were really interesting mm -hmm. until near the end of the game <laughs> like by the time <laughs> by the time hartman came along i was like i don't want to build up the network anymore i don't want to get started because the other way you can get more chiral network is by continually getting likes the more likes yeah. you have, the more the larger a network you can build, so you can build more, more stuff like that. You can build more zip lines, which is what we all need. That's pretty much. I mean, that was the only thing I used PCCs for, for the most part. Yeah, I use them for um, generators to recharge my bike as well. Oh, <laughs> just like a network of like bike generate. See, that would have been smart too. Like, I never really. But again, I never really used bikes, so it wasn't as big of an issue for me. Oh, uh. that's what I wanted to say. I thought it was also the other thing I like a lot is if you if you or someone else you know trods along the same path a lot, mm -hmm. it creates the path on the ground permanently, so it's easier for you to continue to walk. I know. I think I, I thought, thought that, that was brilliant. really neat. Yeah, I thought that was amazing. <laughs> like that. That just like that blew my mind when I realized that in games these days you can have it dynamically create like passages like that. 
mm-hmm. which I feel like is like a, I don't know if you can do that in any other game, but it feels like one of those like, oh, that's a Kojima detail that other people may copy in the future because it's just so brilliant. Well, it's interesting because a lot of the social aspects of the game feel like they were, t- it, it feels like a lot of the ideas, a lot of the social stuff from Dark Souls used well as opposed that's to Dark Souls, it's just there to kind of fuck with you. That's what I was actually going to ask, because I know in Dark Souls, like, people can, like, leave messages and stuff. And I knew that it was, um, at least when Demon Souls came out, people were praising it for its, like, multiplayer aspects. I, like, I was thinking about that in here, where, like, Kojima must have played Dark Souls and had been like, hmm, this is interesting, but what if the player's objects were in the world instead? Yeah, well, it's like, this stuff in Dark Souls and Demon Souls is so limited that it really doesn't... Like, I play the game with online stuff turned off. Oh, because it's because, just that? Yeah, because a lot of the time you'll go somewhere and there's a bunch of messages on the floor saying, like, watch out, and that's it. And <laughs> it's like, it's, well, it's fucking Dark Souls. You have to watch out all the time. Like, everything is always trying to kill you. There's always something behind some corner that's going to leap out and stab you. So, you know, <laughs> it's, that's not very <laughs> like, helpful. Oh, gee, thanks for the watch out. Yeah, yeah. Or, like, occasionally you'll see someone else's ghost, like, run someplace or swing their sword at an enemy you can't see, which implies that an enemy is, is there. Mm. Um, so like you know watch out but like the flip side of that is if you have that stuff turned on other people can invade your world and kill you so I'm not interested in any of that bullshit so I feel like this is like okay well what if what if we had those online elements that were just kind of a curiosity in Dark Souls and Demon Souls and made them like a core part of the game and made them the main feature of the game and made them actually good yeah. And I think you succeeded because it's like the core gameplay is pretty basic. I mean, you just you load up with stuff, you walk around, you have your your bola gun and then later actual guns to fight oh, off the enemies. The bola gun is so awesome. The bola gun is great. I mean, the interesting thing is like your weapon for your only legit weapon for beating BTs is the hematic grenade because I tried like the 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 hematic bullets and those yeah. are useless. <laughs> <laughs> like you have to unload two magazines from an assault rifle into a BT to kill it. It. So you're better off either throwing grenades or sneaking up behind them and um, slicing and cutting their them. umbilical cord. Yeah, which I thought was cool, was a cool feature. Um, well, it's, a, it's like a nice little throwback to Metal to Gear. Metal Gear. <laughs> um, you have to sneak up behind them and do CQC. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Well, you. I mean, you could run into the. Uh, you, you could run into the uh, the mules and do CQC that way too, with fucking clumsy ass Sam swinging his hands around wildly, hoping to hit I know. something. Or you could god. bind them with the strand. Oh my god! <laughs> I love so the terminology. Goofy, but in so this amazing. Game. Um, that was the thing that I. So I don't know if you hated that or loved it, but like to, just to go off really quickly, and I want to loop around back to it. The the game is so heavy handed in its theme that oh, it yeah. pervades every single piece of the game. Everything like, in the game is a metaphor. Which oh, so I great. love because it is so just like I would love it if it was done well and done subtly, but I also love it because it's just so over the top, so and heavy in handed, and so ridiculous. Because well, yeah, I mean, everything they're... is like everyone is named like what they are. Yep. <laughs> so like it's like I'm Heart Man, and my heart is in the shape of a heart, and I live by a lake that's the shape of a heart, and I have heart attacks. <laughs> And, and his likes are hearts. And his likes are hearts. Which is and like then, a Kojima thing. I love it. <laughs> I love how he gives you like a, th- how he like thumbs up the camera. Yep. And yep. then it's like, you got 20 likes. And it and has then, an effect in the game. It's I know. Like, and then like Dead Man. I also like how Heartman, played by Nicholas Winding Refn, I like how his room is like the, is like the neon demon too old to die young room. <laughs> and there is a memory chip you can find out in the world where if you turn it in unlocks um my life directed by nicholas winding refn to be watched as like a watchable extra in wait the are you serious i'm dead serious you can watch my life directed by nicholas winding refn in the game in the game that's amazing <laughs> it's, it's great Oh um, my god. Like, or like how Guillermo del Toro is dead man and he's literally a zombie or like uh, he's made up of all of all like dead parts, like old parts of other people. There's yeah, nothing of like, his own in there. You know, Margaret Qualey is mama and she's a mom or um fucking I didn't, like ev- like how everything is like 
is either beach, sea, water, ocean, strand, the, sand. The, the rope, big BTs are are whales that get beached on the beach. Rope like, knot yep. bridge. Yeah. <laughs> The fact that connecting you're... things. Well, and then of course, like it all comes to like a head when you're fighting uh, Higgs, whose whole job is to like you know destroy things, and he uses a knife, and your whole job is to connect things, and you use a rope. I know. I was like, oh my god, I, was I love of it. Parasite when he's like, this is so <laughs> metaphorical. <laughs> it's so true, though. Oh yeah, my god. It's like... Well, it's funny because in the initial lead up to the game, Hideo Kojima kept talking about this short story where he's like, like there's in, in Japan, you know, there's this story, like the first two things mankind invented were sticks and ropes. Sticks were used to keep things away and to beat back danger. And ropes were used to secure things that were important to us. All the tools we see in video games up to this point are sticks. sticks. I'm going to make a game where your tool is a rope. So and like awesome. I mean it's kind of like like that sounded amazing and that's what got me interested in the game. And I mean it's it's kind of true. Obviously you do have like guns and knives yeah. and shoot people. Well, I wonder if he put those in cuz he's like okay, so here's where I'm kind of like run into some questions. But I, I just it. wanted to say like go ahead, go they ahead, do go quote ahead. that short they do um, re reference that short story twice in the game cuz Higgs when you fight Higgs at the end and he's got his knife and it's you've got your over. rope you have to bind him with the strand, a.k.a. tie him up yes. with a rope. You have to hog tie him. Like, he says, you know, it's stick versus rope. And mm -hmm. then uh, later on at the very end of the game, when there's the gun that they use to, like, that, like, uh, like when you're trapped in the other world mm -hmm. and um, all your friends are able to find you using the gun that you have and that they mm. have in the real world, Dead Man says, like, it, this is the, it's the stick that's also a rope. <laughs> <laughs> oh man i missed that but yeah that's that's yeah and then fucking sam he keeps changing his name to be different metaphors he's like my original name was sam strand mm -hmm. and then because he became disconnected from people he was sam porter he just he's like i'm not connected to anybody i just carry things now i'm sam porter and then later on it's like imagine it's like you're the bridge to the future He's now Sam Bridges. <laughs> your real name is Sam. You're, like your mom's last name, Lisa Bridges. You're Sam Bridges. <laughs> so great. I, I realize that it's all super heavy handed. Yeah. But I loved every second of it. Because like, so I'm used to well, playing. And if you play other Kojima games, you're used to ultra heavy handed storytelling. A lot. <laughs> you're the like Metal Gear Solid Five. Like, oh yeah, like, you remember the fucking ending of Metal Gear Solid 2, where it's just like yeah. documentary footage of New York City, and Solid Snake is just monologuing, he's like, You are an individual, resist social control, I will leave behind my legacy, that is more than just my genes, but the impact we have on the world. <laughs> Well, I feel the like the government is I, controlling the flow of information. <laughs> like, it's, it's like this twenty-minute long thing about how it's like you are an individual. The actions you do are like the legacy you leave behind. Resist social control. <laughs> <laughs> Lolly Lule Low, man. Lolly, Lolly Lule Low. low. Or like in Metal Gear Solid Five, when you sit in the back of a truck for twenty minutes while Skullface explains like linguistics to you. <laughs> and he's like, I'm going to destroy language <laughs> because language bad. Revenge. <laughs> well, that. <laughs> oh my god, I love Kojima games so much. Well, that's so that's the thing. Like, I I, I like Suda 51's games. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know if you like. Um, he's like, the guy who did No More Heroes, right? He did No More Heroes, yeah. But his stuff is like it's weird and on the nose. Yeah. And it just kind of stays that way. Whereas, like, with Kojima, he actually, like, is like, yeah, it's weird. It's on the nose. Like, for Vamp, for example, it's like, oh, I want to put a vampire in my game. Oh, but he's not just any vampire. Like, he's, you know, like, he's the, like, hard sci-fi version of a, of a vampire. Like, and his everything name is in, Vamp. And his name is Vamp, just in case it's not, you know, I'm on vamp, the nose. I'm Vampire. <laughs> it's like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Or like, or like Fortune in Metal Gear Solid 2. A lot of my references are going to probably come out of Metal Gear Solid Metal Gear Solid 2. But like Fortune in Metal, Metal Gear, Gear Solid, Solid 2. Was probably the, 
I was gonna say Metal Gear Solid 2 is probably the most important game I ever played in terms of like forming my taste on video games. I think that's the way for a lot of people. Because like, well, like Metal Gear Solid 2 is fucking crazy. It's nuts. That game like Sons of Liberty was a real game changer, I think. And then like, you know, Snake Eater was amazing, but it's just sort of like the follow-up to that, you know. I I think Snake Eater for Kojima is like is almost a more important game because like it's more of like a Kojima game, whereas Metal Gear Solid 2, it has all the Kojima stuff, but it also has to try and like tie in. I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I, I also heard that yeah. I think uh, Snake Eater was supposed to be the last one. Um, that was the last one he was going to direct. He was going to stop at Snake Eater. Well, and then... no, I think that was supposed to be the last Metal Gear game, and then he came out of retirement like four times to do yeah, yeah. Guns of the Patriots, Portable, Portable Ops, Ops, Peace Walker, and then Peace Phantom Walkers Pain. and then Phantom Pains. Yeah. Also, um, Die Hardman yeah. always just makes me think of Hot Coldman from uh, Portable Ops. I never played Portable Ops. I never played it either. I just know that there's a guy named Hot Coldman <laughs> in that game. <laughs> <laughs> or like, I love, I loved. That's the other thing is I love all of uh, Kojima's villains. I know. The other thing, one thing I really liked about Death Stranding compared to like Metal Gear Solid Five is that you know Kojima historically has always had amazing. Um, boss battles in mm -hmm. his games, you know, especially Metal Gear Solid Three. But like, yes, e like two and four and even one have great boss fights. Oh, one has, Metal Gear Solid one has one of the most iconic boss fights that everyone always remembers in Psycho Mantis. I know. Well, it's not much of a boss fight though. <laughs> it's just like a cool moment where if you're a kid and you don't understand how your controller works, it's like he's moving my controller. Oh he's my like God. reading my memory card. He knows I oh, played. He's I he knows I played him. Okami. <laughs> I can't hit him. <laughs> Why um, can he memorize my movements? Uh, but but uh, yeah, I would say three three has some of the best. But yeah, five I mean, the didn't boss have fight at the end right? is amazing in three. Well, um, it depends. How did you beat him? I just shot him. <laughs> you didn't I shot you didn't him. <laughs> <laughs> I snuck up to him and I stabbed the motherfucker. You didn't uh, you didn't move your clock forward like a month or a year so that he died of old age. <laughs> no, <laughs> I know that's a thing you can do, which is great. But that's no, I why just I love him. Kojima's games. I know it's shit yeah, like then, that. The thing is, Metal Gear Solid Five came along, and I was really excited for the boss fights, and there weren't any. I that's what I heard. That's one of the reasons I stayed away. There's two boss battles in the whole game. One you fight. It's just, it's basically just a repeat of the end boss fight, but less interesting. Ugh. And then um, like just a standard like battle a giant robot boss fight at the very end of the game. I mean. <laughs> And also the game's you know, not finished. <laughs> yeah, that was the, that's the other thing that makes me, that made me, well, I mean, I would even say that the last truly finished Metal Gear Solid game was three. Because four feels, since we're getting into his, like, whole gameography, four mm -hmm. feels like it was, because it's so balanced and the first two chapters feel complete. Especially mm -hmm. that second chapter is so long. Yeah. But then, like, the third chapter is basically just, like, an elongated cutscene with a little bit of shooting. The fourth chapter, you go all the way through um, Shadow Moses for some reason. And then the fifth chapter is basically just, like, running to the end of a room. Yeah. So, like, it, it feels like maybe there was more content that he wanted in there, but he was rushed to get it finished. In time. I, don't, I don't think that was the case with four. I think with four, it was... Um... Oh, the point I was making about boss battles is yes. I like that Death Stranding has a lot of boss battles. <laughs> yes, it has a lot of boss battles, and it has a lot of bo of optional boss battles, too. Yes. But, yeah, the, the thing with 4, though, I think it was, you know, because he was sort of coming out of his Metal Gear Solid retirement to do it, because fans were hounding him for it, I think that he wanted to make, like, he, he kind of wanted to make the, the Star Wars you know, Force Awakens, Rise of Skywalker of Metal Gear Solid games, where it's like, he's still doing all the crazy shit that he wants to do, but a lot of it is, <clears throat> you know, just for, stuff for the fans, like going back through Shadow Moses. It's like, hey, remember, remember Metal Gear Solid 1? Let's go through Shadow Moses again, but in HD this time. You remember um, finding that so calm? It's still there, <laughs> even though it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So I think it's just kind of like a big nostalgia fill. Like it, it's meant to be this big blowout because you realize like 
pretty early on in the game that nothing makes any sense anymore because the, <laughs> the storyline has become so convoluted you can't understand what's happening and they just use nano machines to fill all the plot holes that's the wor- that's the biggest crime of the game how does <laughs> yeah. vamp work nano machines it's fine Sneak How up the, behind the, him and the genome him. soldiers, nano machines. Nano machines. Everything it's is nano machines. What are what are yeah. the patriots? They're all nano machines or something. What's yeah. awesome? What what's the deal with revolver, liquid, ocelot, snake man? Well, that nano machines. Sex- no, he 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 conditioned his brain. He can't <laughs> he can't live in a world without a big boss surrogate. So instead of it being cool where liquid's mind or whatever in the super japanese like weird shit akira where like all of his conscious transferred to his hand that was attached to revolver ocelot <laughs> dominating revolver ocelot's brain it's like oh no just kidding he went to a psychiatrist really hardcore yeah and, like got himself hypnotized into it like which i kind cool. of like the akira thing where it's like liquid's mind is in his hand and oh, it's yeah. possessed revolver ocelot well that's um, so his games feel so hard so, like he does so much research into like making everything sound plausible that when mm-hmm. he does something batshit insane like that <laughs> i just go with it and i'm like that's fucking awesome <laughs> it know. sounds good enough it's a good enough thing so i like yeah. all of that stuff and all a lot of that stuff gets ruined by like Nano machines, like van- nano machines, nano machines, nano machines. Ugh. So I feel like four is a finished game. It's just five. They literally ran. He literally got fired before he could complete it. Yeah. So well, this, this, I, the storyline just kind of drops off after a and certain I don't, point. I don't blame them for firing him on it, but <laughs> at the same time, like, because he was pumping a lot of resources into a game that probably never would have come out. Like, yeah. I think he could have just invented more reasons to have it not come out. Cause which like, is, there's, you know, which is weird because like the the gameplay in Metal Gear Solid Five is like perfect. It has know, that's probably weird. the most perfect gameplay I've ever experienced. Because like all the controls are are airtight, everything, all the systems and everything work excellently. It's just the overarching plot is kind of a mess because it's the Metal Gear Solid Five, so. You have like twenty years of confusion that you're trying to like layer another game on top of, and it doesn't even try to kind of tie itself in too much to the other games. It just has its own <laughs> quasi nonsensical storyline <laughs> that that doesn't resolve at the end because it, because you got fired before you could finish. But it has, like, like, some of the most amazing gameplay ever. And I think everyone should play it just on that merit alone. Like, even if the story's a fucking disaster. And a lot of the statements that he's trying to make get a little confused because, you know, he wasn't able to go through with them all the way. You know, it's still... The game is so much fun. And it's so good. And, like... It's got like good like emotional moments too, and it, it even like references. It's it's pretty self aware that at this point like Revolver Ocelot's motivations still they're like every game they just get more and more confusing, and then this like just embraces that. <laughs> like no one knows what side he's on, <laughs> and this game is very aware that no one knows what side he's on. So it is worth. So five is worth like. It, like if I can find the collection of grounds, no ground zeros <coughs> and uh, the phantom pains. If I can find the combo pack, it's worth buying. Definitely. Okay. All right. I go back and forth because I know it's an incomplete game, but multiple people have said it controls like beautifully. So. Oh kind it, of, it, yeah, you know. it, it's so beautiful. Like like when you're moving snake around, like just the gentlest nudge of your controller moves him in like the perfectly proportionate way versus like pushing it all the way forward moves him in like the perfectly proportionate way to that like the degree of fine control you have over the character and all his movements is like is unprecedented and uh, the way yeah it's just yeah the game perfect gameplay that's that's about all i can say so i'll also say this i have Mm -hmm. always been a huge fan of the way kojima's (laughs) games control like i thought that I, I love the way that Death Stranding controls for the most part, about 90% of the time. Yeah. Every now and then you get into a situation where you're like, I should be able to climb up this. Mm. Sam isn't moving. And then all of a sudden he'll just fall over and like all of your freight will take like 100 points of damage and BB will be like <laughs> blurting out like, <laughs> and you're like, what the fuck just happened? Can I go back? Let me just go back a little bit. But like for the most part, I feel like his game. So two things that I love about his games, the control 
Mm -hmm. And the sound design. Every yeah. sound is like fucking <clears throat> perfect. Mm -hmm. I don't know how he does it and I'm so jealous. The controls in his the controls in Japanese games generally, but I think in his games in particular, tend to be very slick and very his, like, yeah. polished and tight and very there's very little to complain about. I think the only Japanese game I can think of that controls kind of poorly is Dark Souls, but I, from what I've heard, from what I've heard, that's intentional. Like it's like there's a weird delay between anything you do and when it actually happens. And Ugh. from what I've heard, that it's meant to be that way. They're trying to ape Western games. Oh, I'm just well, no, it's <laughs> it's part of that weird like sadism that the designer has, where it's like just to fuck with you when you press attack. There's like a second and then a very Before slow <laughs> sword swing. <laughs> Maybe that's why I like Japanese games better, but you know, like again, every like when Sam's drinking monster, uh or if you oh did I don't gosh. know if, I don't know if you did the optional side quest where instead of drinking monster now he drinks uh he drinks porter beer. No, what? Oh yeah. <laughs> There's an option one of the standard orders, they they ask you to pick up something from the time farm. And oh, it's like, I think I delivered, delivered to beer it. to uh, yes. Edgar Wright. So after... At, <laughs> <laughs> well, when you go into your private room every time after that, mm -hmm. the drink is not Monster anymore. It's like Porter beer. That's hilarious. So, yeah, it's awesome. I'm like, fuck yeah, dude. Um, yeah, like the weird like Monster Energy trademark. Tie-in. Like yeah. tie-in was bizarre. But like Kojima does a lot of bizarre things that... The iPod in Metal Gear Solid Four, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or like the um, like the weird anime posters all around Mother Base in Metal Gear Solid Five. Um, yeah, there's a lot of weird shit. That's like if you're not into it, that's cool. You're not into it. For other people, it's just like they don't really notice, and other people, I think, just find it funny. Well, that's, like, I love all of his Easter eggs. Like, that's, I think, what got a lot of people who loved Metal Gear Solid. That's why they started, that's, like, what really hooked him in. If you, like, in the first game, if you go and lean a, up against the wall and knock on it, and the guy's, like, the DARPA chief is, like, what? What's that? Like, mm -hmm. little things like that. There's, um, or, like, how we were talking about how, like, the end dies that way. Mm -hmm. um, God, there's, I feel like there's another one. Because uh, he has, like, a bunch of them. Like, in Boktai, since it's, like, a game with a solar panel, if you're, like, standing outside while you play, light shines through all the windows. Uh, fuck. Um, there's, in Zone of the Enders, this, the the second one, like, there's this one time where you're carrying one of your friends, or, like, she's following you, and if you go down too far into the heat zone and stay there too long, like, she takes off her shirt and she's wearing, like, a tank top the rest of the game. It's, like, it's weird <laughs> shit like that. Um... Fuck, dude. I'm trying... Ah, oh, damn it. There's... But, like, I love all of the Easter... Little... E like, that's the other reason I'm a huge fan of him. Like, um, uh, Metal Gear Solid, when you have to... When you have to find Meryl, you have to look at the back. It's like, check the back of the package, which is, like, anti-piracy, but also, like, a fun gimmick where it's like, oh, yeah, in the back of the package, there's literally a screenshot of the game where Snake says Meryl and it has her codec conversation <laughs> um like i was i'm glad that codec was back but it was but it's used so stupidly in four that it's like done away with but codec was like one of the best gameplay elements i thought of metal gear solid that made it different than like reading a book or mm -hmm. or watching a movie so like anytime kojima exploits things that are like super gamer type stuff mm -hmm. i think that's what another reason i like him because he's so into the medium as a storytelling device oh yeah and he's definitely into a lot of really idiosyncratic choices like you know look at the back of the game to get meryl's code look at the back of the game box to yes. get meryl's kodak code or in metal gear solid 2 when everything's glitching and you're inside arsenal gear like i think you have to restart <laughs> the game or reload it or something for it to work and then like it's like, oh, Colonel Campbell's a robot or whatever. Um, oh, I didn't do that. I just ran straight for it. I was like, oh, fission mailed, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> or like, you know, a, a freaking... Or the best is Psycho Mantis, how he can like move your controller and read your yeah. memory card. And then when he appears again in Metal Gear Solid 4, he can't move your controller because your controller's wireless. Right. 
What? And it's the six <laughs> axis that didn't have the vibration function. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking six axis. Uh, in Metal Gear Solid 3, if you die and you wait long enough, it says time paradox. <laughs> um, in yeah. uh, Metal Gear Solid 5, I think they patched this, but earlier on, you could beat uh, the sniper quiet by airdropping care packages onto her head. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> why would they take that out i don't know because that's, that's such, such a kojima thing yeah but that, exactly. I, I don't know why they removed it but like I, it's like it, it's very much like him to have an option for you to cheese a yeah. boss that way <laughs> or like uh, metal gear solid 4 like if you put the magazine down and you're low on stamina you put the magazine down and you look at it it starts increasing your stamina bar <laughs> <laughs> um uh, the other thing I like that I was sad that they did away with starting with 4. Cause, like, I have a love-hate with Metal Gear Solid 4 because mm -hmm. I love that they did all of this great stuff with it where, like, they expanded it out farther than, like, you know, they gameplay-wise, it was, like, incredibly, you know, more detailed and more things you could do than 3. But then they got rid of a bunch of stuff like the codec conversations. You only mm -hmm. had two codec numbers for the most part. The... But they also had codec conversations that last half an hour. Right. Well... <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but you always did. It's, um, yeah, kind of. But that, or like, uh, the, other, the thing that I hated the most was taking away the quick reload option, which mm -hmm. I realized was a glitch. It was kind of like a, a glitch that the game developers exploited for the player to use. Yeah. Where like you can, uh, if you do a quick select of your item, it'll automatically reload it. That's awesome. And they got rid mm -hmm. of it. And I was like, it took me a long time to get over that as a gameplay element. I was like, that's, but that's, it's like the fundamental part of Metal Gear Solid is the quick reload for me. The fundamental um, part of Metal Gear Solid that was changed by 4 was um, in earlier games, you had to stand completely still in order to shoot somebody. <laughs> and 4, you <laughs> and could shoot year. and move at the same time. I, I actually hated that they moved the key, the CQC button and the mm -hmm. fire button to the shoulder buttons. Yeah. Like, it's I, I it's fine that they did that for, like, shooting, but I'm glad that in Death... I don't know if they did this in 5, but in Death Stranding, like, in order to shoot, you'd have to hold L2 and then press R2, but you could use Dude, Square in, to fight people. In like, 5, hand there's, hand like, hand. a full-on CQC, like, workflow you can go through. Oh my god! <laughs> I loved the bet. My favorite thing of three was running up to people and and use CQC on them. And yeah. like they had a bunch of stuff in four, but it was so poorly implemented that like I never did it. It's like ah, just get me the gun and I'll start shooting people. I love yeah. Metal Gear Solid Four, even with its flaws, just because it's so much fun to play through. And like my brother played, yeah. like he beat the game like five times or something, and he got a bunch of achievements. Like he got like the solar gun. Yes, and stuff. yeah. Like my friend beat it on the on the boss extreme with the solar ooh, gun. He had to do it yeah. twice. He had to do it twice because one time he hit someone with a solar gun that was on the that was on the wall, and the person fell to their death, and it no. counted as a death. Yep. Oh, yep. That sucks. Yep. Yeah. So, but see, it's things like that too. It's like like we'll bring it back to Zest Stranding quickly, but like um, it's all of those little things that are like sprinkled throughout the game. Like, yeah. all of those little elements. And the fact that he makes games where he inc he actively encourages you not to kill people. Yeah. Since the first Metal Gear Solid. Ever since the, yeah, ever since the original Metal Gear, like, which is it's, pretty great. And then, yeah. the thing is, in, like, Death Stranding, you know, in the, in the Metal Gear games, they're combat games. So, it's like, if you kill someone, it's like, well, that's unfortunate. But yeah. you, you shouldn't do that, but oh well. Whereas yeah, but, this, like, like snake's, a, a snake's a trained killer. So, it's like, okay, yeah. well, it, if it happens, it happens. Whereas, yeah, Death in, uh, yeah, in Death Stranding, like, you get actively punished for killing people. Like, you could cause a void yes. out that destroys a huge chunk of the map that you can now no longer cross over. And, like, it makes the, it covers the area in BTs, which actually makes the game harder. Yep. Which is, like, another great element. Well, and then the other thing is, like, I, again, I haven't played 5, so I don't know how the shooting compares in Death Stranding to 5. But if the shooting is worse and if it's kind of hard for Sam to shoot... It makes sense because Sam delivers packages. He's not Die Hard Man. So he's not. He's not. He's not Big Boss, the greatest soldier who ever lived. <laughs> no, he is not. Nor the so good at boss. war. He wanted to create a world of perpetual warfare that soldiers will always have a purpose, which is also weirdly the plot of Star Trek Beyond. <laughs> 
I just I thought it was so weird that Star Trek Beyond's plot is literally just the plot of Metal Gear and Idris Elba is Big Boss. <laughs> That's amazing though. Like, <laughs> hey, hey man, Simon Pegg's a fan of a lot of things. It's possible yeah, he's a true. fan of Metal Gear Solid. <laughs> oh my god. Fuck, I mean I don't even know where where to where to go from here. Yeah, I'll say something. Um, you know, we yes, were talking about Revolver definitely. Ocelot and how his motivations make no sense. I think Amelie slash Bridget Strand is the new Revolver Ocelot, where <laughs> I played through the full game and I still don't know why she was doing any of what she was doing. Because she's like, she's like, has all these good intentions, like we need to bring the world back together, we need to make us whole again, which is very poor phrasing. <laughs> <laughs> we are two <laughs> Japanese writers that do not write in English. Which is weird that they have so much wordplay and like puns in this game, given that it was written in Japanese. It's like all the strand, knot, bind, bridge, beach. I'm guessing thing. that because I I know with Metal Gear Solid Four they had like a an American game consultant to help them out. So I'm wondering yeah. if they had like a an American like writing consultant because I'm sure Maybe. there's a lot of similarity between those things in japanese like maybe i i don't know i would i wouldn't know but like um it might just be the translators having fun yeah, at the it could be. Lives expenses <laughs> but like i you know she seems to have all these good intentions in terms of like connecting the world again but she's also like i need to annihilate all life in the universe <laughs> <laughs> so it's like wait which is it though like like you're more confusing than ocelot at this point, like, do you want to connect everyone and make the world better or just cause the end, like, collapse the universe and destroy everything? Because I guess, like, her motivation is, you know, there's, like, these cycles of extinction that go on and she wants to stop it by ending, like, time itself, which, I, okay, fine. That, if that's your motivation, cool, because it's, like, a, a, an, a good, like, supervillain sort of motivation, but also at the same time being, like, well, I want to connect the world and I want everyone to be happy. And like, there's like, it's all, it gets even weirder later on in the game where you sort of find out like her backstory. Like her backstory is whatever, but when you find out <laughs> Sam's backstory with respect to her and how she's like, like she's slowly losing her mind and like bringing about this plan to start the end of days, but then almost kind of does it on accident out of like a moment of feeling bad for young Sam. You know, because like it's implied that the Death Stranding was originally started when, you know, her when Bridget, her human avatar, kills Sam as a baby, and then her Amelie, the the world of the dead avatar. Yeah, her like, car. Yeah, her 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 soul who exists in the world of the dead finds Sam's spirit and feels really really bad about it, and brings him back to life, but in doing so causes the death stranding like that's what allows you know bts B, you know what allows the spirits of dead people to strand like whales on a beach on the beach of reality god these fucking metaphors are just too much <laughs> you're, um, you're getting overloaded in beached things realities strands ropes ladders yeah because well, okay yeah because the metaphor is is like the world of the dead is like the ocean and the world of the living is the land and the space between them is the beach. And strand is another word for beach. And like whales become beached or stranded. <laughs> right. They wash up on the beach and die. The spirits of the dead become beached or stranded where they wash up on the beach between worlds and end up getting stuck in the world of the living where they wreak havoc. Which is really cool as like an intuitive metaphor, but when you try to explain it out loud, you sound like a moron. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, then, I mean, that's it, why it the start of the game takes that, three like, hours to get started. I know. And it also doesn't help that beach is, a, like, strand is a synonym for beach, but it's also a synonym for, like, a, a rope. rope that connects things. And then there's but all see, this that's... rope shit about knots and ropes and... That's... and God, <laughs> it that's what makes it so brilliant, though, is that it is. But it's, it's you also know, for, annoying. <laughs> for for lack of, for lack of a better term, everything in the game is connected. It's uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. but that's why I love it so much. Like like he he took the metaphor and he just 
he didn't just run with it. He like put a jet rocket pack on him and just went all the way there like, he, the like, whole time. He like shot it into outer space like Elon Musk. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. He shot it all the way to outer space so the psychonauts could <laughs> no, not the psychonauts, the uh the police, police knots knots? could bring it back down. Yep, yep. The police but, knots. But yeah, so like I'm not totally sure what Amelie slash Bridget what they're what why they were doing what they were doing or what totally is going on because they seem like very their motivations seem very conflicted and it the game tries to like hand wave that away where like it's just sort of implied that like amelie slash bridget is insane right or like you know is slowly going insane because she's got all these visions of the apocalypse you know right <clears throat> Honestly, I don't know. I just know that she, I thought that she was like, she was bringing about the end of the world. And Sam had a moment where he could stop the end of the world from happening if he killed her. But the game, I think, forces you instead of doing what you would think, which is to kill her, which is the game has been teaching you, no, you don't want to kill things. Mm -hmm. You go up to her and you hug her and that like strands her on the beach forever so that in another thousand years she will cause an extinction event? Well, I think it's something like it stops her from doing anything so that humanity can survive until the next Death Stranding when another extinction entity comes along and tries to start it up. Because I think her deal was like she realized that she would somehow cause a mass extinction and is like, well, what if I just cause a final extinction instead? Mm -hmm. So instead of some species survive and continue on until the next mass extinction, what if I just end it all right now? Did you try to shoot her? No. I didn't either. But that part was kind of spoiled for me already. Oh. Uh, yeah, I was yeah. trying to figure out, like, I was like, I shouldn't shoot her, but I don't know what to do. And then I, I figured out, it's like, oh, you can run up to her. Like, after, you know, failing the thing several times. Oh, you <laughs> failed? <laughs> Well, it's like you, you reset, it resets, you know, like the world blows up and it's like, would you like to connect again? And then you have to replay that moment until you do it right. Oh, seriously? I didn't, I, yeah. oh, wow. Cause I knew what to do. So I just went, wow. Oh, yeah, I didn't know what to do. Oh my God. Did you try talking to her? No, like, I was did like, you try what do I do? The center button. Oh, wow. I, I put the gun away. I tried doing a bunch of other stuff. And then it's like, cause the whole thing is like you, you have trouble running in water. <laughs> Right. So, it's so like, you wanted I, to I stay away. I follow. I figured I couldn't follow her into the ocean. And then it's like, oh, wait, let me try this. And it's like, oh, I can follow her into the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> well, so that's, I guess that's also part of where I have a little bit of problems with the game. Because at least with Metal Gear Solid, if I was ever stuck, I could open up the codec and ask <laughs> what I need to do. Yeah, yeah. They can, they, yeah, exactly. The codec tells you what to do. Um, but like for for the game... You could read emails, but at that point you wouldn't. So I don't like. I honestly don't know how you would have come to that conclusion. Like, yeah, you have to just you know, either look it up or like try out different options until you get it. Yeah, but I guess looking it up, you have to go on the internet, connect to the internet, and use someone else's advice. Oh no, oh. we've gotten eighteen layers deep in the in the metaphor category for this game now. <laughs> oh god. Oh yeah, my god. It's also like. There's a, there's a few moments like that, like where you have to, where, um, like after you beat the Amelie Higgs, like monster boss, mm -hmm. um, and you have to, Higgs takes yes. Amelie to the beach and you mm -hmm. have to figure out how to get to the beach and it does not explain at all to you how, and then you have to use Fragile's like, um, umbrella jump. Yep. But the thing is, like, I never used that in the entire game. So I forgot it existed. <laughs> I think I, I used it a couple of times. Or no, I used it one time. But I yeah, I forgot it, that that was an option. I used it a couple of times, and then I was like, <clears throat> I was running around. I was, what I was going to do was I was going to jump. I was going to try and climb onto a building and then commit suicide <laughs> to see if, <laughs> like, maybe, like, I messed up. Because, like, right before that, you're, like, you become, no, a repatriate. Or yeah. repatriate, and I thought I had. It's fucked repatriate, up by finding... but Guillermo del Toro's weird act, a, like a repatriate. You know, his Ren and Stimpy actor says it. <laughs> repatriate, repatriate. <laughs> um, but like after you revive, like I thought I had messed up, so I was like, oh, maybe I need to kill myself. And then Sam starts talk. If you run around enough, <laughs> Sam starts talking, 
It's like, how yeah. am I going to get to the beach? What am I going to do? How am I going to get back to the beach? And I was like, oh, that's right. Because in order to transport from place point A to point B, you have to use the beach to transport there. And I was like, oh, let me run back to the fucking private room again. Yep. <laughs> where's, the, where's the battery recharge station? <laughs> There, it's, it's, some other cool things. Uh, well, yeah, so yes, I agree that I don't understand Bridget's plan at all. But I understand I was, her plan. I just, I just don't understand her motivations for her plan. Also, I don't understand I don't her plan, quite honestly. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> as you were explaining it to me, I was like, I remember them talking about this. I don't remember. Because I don't understand how Higgs is involved in her grand plan either. He seems I like think... unnecessary. I know. I mean, he was a cool villain. <laughs> He's totally a cool villain. Because the other thing with Kojima games is they have great characters' designs, and typically they have cool villains. And Higgs is really cool. <laughs> yeah, it, I feel like he's what Skullman was supposed to be, or Skullface. I know. Skullface. He literally is just Skullface again. He is, but he can take it off, and he's got like that southern twang, and he's like, "Fuck, yeah. dude, this guy's." Is... Well, Skullface's whole plan was like kind of apocalyptic as well, because his whole thing was. He believed that America had colonized the world and was kind of controlling everyone. So he wanted to wipe out the English language to remove the effect of like American colonization and culture and then give everyone nuclear weapons that were all controlled by him. So there, everyone would be locked in like a nuclear stalemate and that would somehow bring about world peace. And I'm like, dude, this guy's nuts. <laughs> dude, that's amazing. I know. And people I'll... said Thanos' plan was crazy. Dude, the, the the plans of Metal Gear villains are always, like, amazingly They're... insane. I know, but that's what makes them so great. Like, remember in Metal Gear Solid 2, the, the, uh, Solidus' snake's whole plan was to dismantle the government uh, information controls with like memes or something. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Because so, he's like, it's like you know the you know memes are controlling the way that people think. We have to like have complete freedom of information. Blah 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 blah. And I'm like, what? And then now we're like, we're I think everyone now should go back and play Metal Gear Solid Two because the plot of that game is literally just the world we're living in right now. Yeah. Well, and it's <laughs> what the game take. What year does that game take place in? I think it takes place in like 2007. Yeah, or something it, like it takes that. place in like the late 2010s, or no, in the late 2000s, the late aughts. God, if if people can even work their way through it, <laughs> like it's it's, it's really your solid too. It's not that bad. It's not that convoluted. It's pretty and, straightforward. And yeah, well, and as the years have gone, it's like we've had less and less like insane revisions to how games are played as well. Mm -hmm. So there's like a nice kind of like through line where it's like it's not as bad. But it can, it's still going to be kind of weird for people who had never experienced anything like that before. Yeah. As you know, I love the techno babble in Kojima's games, and I loved mm -hmm. all of the weird techno babble stuff in Death Stranding. Like the way that <laughs> the, the FG kill a BT, it like forms the shape of two hands. Yeah. And um, like the, the chiral crystals are always like these hand shaped things. Yeah, and, and like um, the chiral network in general, how it's like this amazing network that can print objects, like a 3D mm -hmm. printer, but like yeah. it's all connected through a bunch of other stuff. And it's um, like some weird technological advancement that's connected to like the land of the dead. And yeah. And about the end of the world at the same time. <laughs> Which was like I thought that was uh, I thought that was Higgs's plan the whole time. He was like, or not Higgs's plan, um, Die Hardman's plan. No, John Die Hardman McLean. Oh my God! Did no. you just get, did <laughs> just you just get that now? I just got that now. <laughs> what the fuck? John Die Hardman McLean. Jesus Christ. <laughs> 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 Oh my god. But like I thought Die Hardman's plan was to like cuz like they were like, "Oh, Die Hardman's up to no good. Die Hardman's up to no good. Be careful, Sam. Die Hardman is up to no good. Be I don't careful, trust Sam. the director. I do not trust the director." Um <laughs> uh but like he, yeah, he had no idea that they just needed a more stable Cupid. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's what I got out of all of that. Like I know. there was like mother was like, "Hmm, the Cupid is not stable enough." And I was like, "It's it, it's not." Okay, can you make a more stable one? And she's like, well, no, not yet. 
but like we, <laughs> we have to fake like we have to fake and pretend like we we don't have one mm-hmm. um but like i love all of the like weird science stuff like how the bb gets uh autotaxemia and how sam porter bridges a man who is trying to connect the world his main issue is the fact that he doesn't like being touched and yep. by the end of the game he gets over <clears throat> it i'm like Again, the metaphor all coming back back in on itself. He is finally able to connect with something. I which know. Is, you know, a dead baby in a pod. <laughs> Did you get all of the emotions at the end of the game when you had to put the the BB in the uh, in the incinerator? Not really. I I started tearing up during all of the Mads Mikkelsen stuff. Oh, really? Like, like where the he, final connection? Well, wh- when you when you fight him in Vietnam, there's that mm-hmm. cutscene where he that like I I got all like choked up at that, and then I got even more choked up at the end when like you get all the flashbacks played out like movie style instead of like mm-hmm. through the eyes of a stillborn baby, um, <laughs> <laughs> which could be very confusing. And then, like, you know, uh, Mads Mikkelsen is, like, talking to Sam and all that stuff. And also when he, like, at the end, when he's dying and he's, like, talking about how he's, like, so, like, I, you know, it's, like, I was worried being a father would make me scared, but it made me brave. And I'm, like, oh, fuck, dude. (laughs) (laughs) Dude, Mads Mikkelsen is just incredible in this game. I'd say, like, almost, I'd say almost all the actors are incredible in the game. All the actors do really well, but Mads Mikkelsen is on another like level completely. Yeah. And yeah. I, I will say, I think uh, uh, Leia Sedu does a really good job too, but she just mm-hmm. has so many like bad puns she has to say. I'm fragile, but I'm not that fragile. Like, they, just, like, <laughs> they kept repeating it and repeating and repeating. So by the end of the game, as Sam's leaving, it's like fragile. It's like, I'm fragile, not that fragile with like 60 year old hands. Like, <laughs> fucking only Kojima could, and then he explains why she has the sixty-year-old hands. So weird. yeah, <laughs> so weird. oh my goodness, oh I love this game so much. It's so weird. <laughs> <sighs> oh, and the fact that okay, here here's another. I know this is another, de- but like how if you grab two, if you grab something with your left hand or your right hand, and he, it's like oh yeah, you have to throw this, and the game is explicitly like. Make sure if you want to throw it farther, you grab it in your right hand because Ham throws farther in his right hand. I was like, no one else would ever put that in a game. No one else would care to be like, yeah, the character is explicitly right-handed. Mm-hmm. But this game has it. I was like, okay, that's... Oh, my God. <laughs> but we should probably talk about some of the bad stuff about the game, too, to, to, to be fair. Yeah, probably. Um... I don't. I actually don't like how the game goes away from the bola gun or like mm-hmm. creative weapon, creative use of weapons. Like, I think that the fact that like the rope is your main melee weapon is a cool concept, and mm-hmm. I like the idea of a bola gun. Again, we're talking about strands, and that you can use the bola gun on a BTS, which I was like, oh, that's kind of cool too. I never did, but that's yeah. kind of cool. Um, but then by the end of the game, I don't use that at all. I don't use the sticky gun, which was actually also really cool, and. I kind of wish they did more with, um, but I didn't use either of those by the end of the game. I was just using guns, and by the time the game becomes kind of like more of a shooting gallery type game with like the terrorists who also have guns, yeah, um, the game kind of like I, I kind of got a little bit disenchanted with it. I thought it was really cool that they were using unique mm-hmm. weapons, but the mm-hmm. fact that they didn't follow through all the way, um, I, I didn't love. <laughs> I mean, I kind of get that. Like, the bola gun's really cool for the mules, but when you're dealing with enemies with guns, it becomes different, you know? Yeah, I yeah. The bola gun I... just becomes a liability at that point. And I think yeah. that, like, especially because boss battles with BTs become a bigger deal later on in the game, you need more robust weapons to deal with them. That, but but see, like, even then, it's like, I, I used the assault rifle, but really, I thought it was fun that they had, like, the hematic grenade launcher. I was like, oh, yeah. that's cool. Or, like, the quadruple rocket launcher. Like, oh, yeah. that's cool. Um, so, like, those are still, like, in line with, like, okay, that's, that's cool shit that you can do. Mm-hmm. Um, but, like, you know, like, assault rifles, like, mm. Yeah. And again, the enemies the enemies' equipment scales with you. So if they had thought of, like, a because the enemies didn't have bola guns that they were using on you. No. Um, if they if they had something and then you had something unique to counteract it, I think that would have been more interesting. But 
that's why I mean, like, I don't know how much of it was, like, a crunch time thing or, like, we know that gamers will be more familiar with guns, so let's give them some typical gun-type things. Even though you can get, like, a like a, a, a grenade launcher that would knock them out. I was like, oh, yeah, like, I think they're, fun. there could have been something else they could have done, you know, to, that was more interesting and creative other than just, like, here's some guns that you see in other games that you have yeah. to use for the same yeah. reasons they're in other games. Did you how many how many times did you uh or I should say do you, do you have any criticisms we can go back and forth like a tennis match here while we try I mean, and think of them My biggest criticism is towards the opening. I think the game just starts way too slow. Like like I said yeah. it doesn't really get fun until chapter 3, which is a shame because like you don't want to have to kind of grit through a good few hours just to get to like oh now I'm having fun. Right. You know, which is, I think, why a lot of people abandon the game after they tried it. Because, like, oh, what the hell? Um, yeah. <clears throat> well, it doesn't help that it starts with about two hours of cutscenes. Like, yeah. the, the gameplay itself is, yeah. is kind of okay. But, like, a lot of it feels like you're moving from cutscene to cutscene. But yeah, it does. I feel like if they don't start you off in, that, in the pace that they start you off with, um, by the time you get to the more complex uh, mechanics of the game you're going to feel really overwhelmed. So. Yeah, I think the only other big criticism I have is that the the game, the communal aspect of it gets sort of minimized towards the end, where right. you're like trekking through the mountains and stuff, it gets minimized a bit, but not like too much. And then the final sort of chapter, like I said, the where you cross back over all the territory you've covered, like mm -hmm. that's really cool. Because yeah, yeah. It, everything... All of the stuff you've built and that other players have built have made it what would otherwise be a terrifying task yeah. much simpler. <laughs> that would have shut off. The, I would have shut off my game if they're like, "Yeah, you don't have anything. Good luck." I know. I would have shut it off too. But it's simulator. like it's really cool because you get to appreciate like how much easier it is now that you've put all this time in to build this stuff. Mm -hmm. But other than that part, you know, a lot of it is more just you're on your own. Mm -hmm. You know, in an yeah. isolated place, on the beach, in a BT encounter, or whatever. Which, you know, I, the best parts of the game, as much as I love boss battles and stuff, the best parts of the game for me were delivering packages while also building things and utilizing things that other people had built. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And also, I mean, there's an aspect of the community aspect in the boss battles where, like, another player will throw you some items yeah which is cool but it doesn't happen frequently enough like because like there were times i didn't have anything to attack the final boss with and i just kind of was like running around like a chicken <laughs> i know um and so, then like, like waiting for people to throw me blood bags and uh, yeah weapons. yeah although i had plenty of blood did you play it on normal or hard normal yeah i played it on normal as well and like i had plenty of blood bags but i was like can i get a can i get another rocket launcher here because I, I just figured out how to beat the boss and like he only has a sliver of health left. It took me that mm -hmm. long to figure out what I had to do. But but yeah, the thing about the community aspect is like the last... When you go back to the first map of the game and you have to get back to the starting city, when they're like, mm -hmm. yeah, you have you have to rely on other people's stuff, you have nothing. Mm -hmm. Like, I could just... Like, I thought that was cool that you had to rely on what everyone else had built you. Yeah. But I also was wondering, like, if you don't play online... How are you going to survive this part of the game? <laughs> Luckily, you don't need plus to, to take advantage of it. But I was just like, man, that would really suck. You're going to have to like chug a long way yeah. and like without any vehicles or anything at the end of the game. Yeah, because that's the thing, too. It's like at the end of the once you get to the end of the game, like you can't create any new vehicles. You have to go with what's around. Yeah. You can like go into the garage and get like someone else's, which are always stock. But like for the most part, yeah, it's just, hmm, good luck, buddy. But yeah, and yeah, like I agree. Like the boss battles were cool because there was there was what like, um, there's, I'm trying to think of all the boss battles. So I, obviously, the Higgs fight was really good. Um, mm -hmm. You had to fight the giant whale at the end. Uh, did you when you had mother strapped to your or mama strapped to your back? Did you actually fight and kill that thing, or did you just run? I just ran. Yeah, same here. You can kill it. But yeah. It just ran. Every time that monster popped up, because it you know it pops up two or three times at the in the end game as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just ran all of those times. <clears throat> yeah, I did. I did too. I was. I, I I employed the the seven samurai. You never have to worry about losing a battle if you run from it. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I, I uh, 
that's that ended up being the best course of action um i um yeah i i also have a problem with the pace of the game like by the time you get to hartman i just was like i had done too much shit and this was just like a little bit too much i was ready for the game to start wrapping up at that time yeah i know what you mean although i think if you're a fan of like nicholas winding ref and that kind of helps to get through yeah. that section <laughs> well i mean i don't i wouldn't have a problem like delivering stuff to Hartman, but like, oh, I got to go to the paleontologist. And yeah, like, I got to go to the like ecogeologist or whatever. And I was like, I'm so the done. Evo Devo biologist. The Evo Devo biologist. Whatever that is. Uh, I was I I was pretty much done by that point of like, all right, now the game feels a little bit. It feels like it's getting a little long in the tooth. Yeah, I know um, what you mean. Although the final, like, when you have to ex get all the like tar draining equipment from the uh the volcanic fields i thought that was really cool oh when you put on the gas mask no 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 no. no. when you Wait. have to like it's like the most bt littered area oh ever and you have to like fight your way through it and get like you have to pick up like seven packages from there yeah 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 i remember that oh my god i did i have no i didn't i didn't have a sticky gun and i was like i'm an idiot i should have gotten the sticky gun <laughs> Like, that would have made it a lot easier. I had to reload an earlier save and load up on hematic grenades and then go back. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Why didn't you just go back and make some? Because I was, like, stuck in it. Like, I thought I could get through with just the cord cutter, but I couldn't. There were too many of yeah. them. <laughs> I should have done more of the cord cutter stuff. I ended up just sneaking past them for the most part. Like, that's another thing is, like, I, I got tired of BT sections because I would just hit the circle button and, like, slowly walk my way through them uh, occasionally throw like a hematic grenade every now and then but like i never but there were always so many that mm -hmm. i could never aside from a couple of early game areas i could never purge an area unless i initiated the the mini boss battle yeah so which i tried to avoid at all costs i i did if i was on a mission but if i wasn't on a mission i'd be mm -hmm. like yeah let's see let's see what happened yeah i avoided <laughs> out a couple times <laughs> oh, that's no good. I managed to avoid voiding out the whole game. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, lucky bastard. It's probably a lot easier <laughs> the way you were playing it, where you're just, like, sneaking up to their corner, you're like, hey, guess what? Snip. Like, yeah, or just, again, lobbing hematic grenades. Yeah, um, I did that too, but I kept running out of them. Like, even when I could uh, customize the backpack, I, <laughs> I put a couple of grenade pouches there, but I ended up running out of them too many I, times. Anytime I saw a mission that looked like it was going through a BT area, I would load up with, like, six hematic grenades and, like, six blood bags, which translates to, I think, 30 grenades or something. Mm, yeah, yeah. And that usually was enough to do it. Not to, like, purge the area of BTs, but to... But just, like, create a line through... Create a path through all the objectives, yeah. yeah. I uh, I ended up using... The other thing I liked was the exoskeletons. I thought that was a cool... Yeah, I like those was a as really well. cool idea. Um, and so I ended up using a speed exos exoskeleton at the end of the game when the when those, like, uh, the things that are dropping on you... Like, yep. I like that you could approach it multiple ways. Like, if you wanted to, you could shoot all of them and clear your path. You could mm -hmm. run past them. You could sneak past them. The fact that that's like that there's all of these tools out there for you to use is really cool, including mm -hmm. the ladder and the rope, which I use the entire game, which is I know kind of a credit to like the design of the game, where they're like they're going to be your first two items, and you're going to use them all the time. Yep. So I know if yeah, because if I wasn't using ladders and ropes that I brought, I was using other people's. <laughs> yeah, pretty much, especially the windfall <laughs> farm. Oh my god, oh the wind farm, I hated. All the time. <laughs> oh. oh, oh, yeah, yeah, the one that's like at the base of the mountain, the the weather station. You mean? No, not the weather station. The weather station. I didn't have a. Was it the weather station? Are yes. Talking about it, the time fall farm. No, not the time fall farm. The the weather the, station. It must the one that was like in the first map, and it was like in. You'd have to go up this mountainy path, and like it would always be windy, and the game's like, remember, if it's windy, Sam has a harder time moving. <laughs> um, and then you had to like go down into the area and after like the first time you deliver a package there it's just continually swarming with bts mm -hmm. uh, but it's an early game area and like but I, ke I kept having to go there and i was like i hate coming here it's such a pain in the ass to get here and i'm always overloaded and i want to just deliver packages that's before i knew how to play the game apparently 
Um, <laughs> which I feel like a lot of people don't know how to play the game properly for a game that has like so many ways you can approach it. The game is a bit obtuse. You're, you're, you are, it just sort of says like, hey, keep this in mind and then mm -hmm. leaves you to figure out like, you know, how to optimize everything, which I think is how most games should be played or how should they should be set up where it's like, I think it's more fun to get like, like these are the controls, here are some suggestions, the rest is for you to figure out. Yeah, I, I, I don't like games fully holding your hand, but like, mm -hmm. I and I do also like games that like, especially a lot of games that have little Easter eggs, like, like this game does. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that it doesn't tell you exactly what to do, but like certain things that develop over time, like, you know what, you don't want to continually overload Sam mm -hmm. with packages. Um, yeah. You want to manage your, you know, you want to manage your stamina really well. You want to pee every now and then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which I was really happy when I peed in the snow, it melted the snow. I That's was like so, so happy. Um, it, was, it, it wasn't like, it wasn't as cool as like real life because the way that the snow simulations work, it just made it like a huge pathway, but mm -hmm. it was still cool that that detail's in there. But like, I feel like a lot of people, I, I, I thought it was crazy that you were talking about how you relied on vehicles the majority of the game. I barely mm -hmm. used vehicles. Like I would use it to get from point A to point B, but if I ever had to go up mountains and stuff, I was just like, eh, I'll just hike it. Dude, I was riding bikes up and down mountains and shit. Like, oh my God. <laughs> Uh, I'm so jealous. <laughs> I know. I, I, I used vehicles. I abused vehicles. That's how much I used vehicles, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, the reverse trike was my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Did you destroy one so far that you actually had to reclaim it? Um, or uh, whatever it was to, to get it back, to repurpose it, get the, the parts back? No, I... If ever I reached a part where I had to abandon the vehicle, I just abandoned it and let it get destroyed <laughs> by time fall while I progressed to my destination on foot. I also thought that was cool. Like, that was cool that like the rain. There's rain in the game, and like it actually has a purpose. Yep. Like and I thought snow. that was yeah, and snow, which also oh, God the 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 whiteouts. Yeah, the white it's <laughs> it, it's cool because this is like one of the few games where weather has a really big impact. Weather and just the environment, and the topography, mm -hmm. have a huge impact on like what you can do. Yeah, um, and how you approach it. Yeah. Yeah, and I know like for a map that's meant to represent the entire United States, it is not. <laughs> the, it's not the most varied, but I think it's it, also so it tiny. <laughs> I know, but it you know games can only be so big within you know before they just start to crumble under the weight of their own size, like Skyrim right. or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, even like, but like to say that like, oh, that's the entire United States. It would have been nice if there was like a document that like, oh, a chunk of the United States broke up and became the United Cities, and it was exactly shaped like the United States but smaller. I'd be like, okay, I can buy that. <laughs> that's fine. I'll I'll understand that, especially because there's no well a that actually here's. Here's a question for you. There's no day-night cycle in the game. No, there isn't. Is that because they had it had something to do with the moon? Because every time you'd go to the beach, you could see the moon. Mm -hmm. So was I the moon like destroyed? I I don't know. I don't think. I think there just is no day-night cycle in the game because they couldn't be bothered. Um, yeah, I mean, and I don't I'm okay mind. with that because yeah, like, I don't mind. Because like, imagine trying to like fight BTS at night. Oh God, that sounds I bet, horrifying. I if that's like, I wonder if that's one of the reasons. The other thing is, like, you're never traveling that far, and so it doesn't feel like... Like, sometimes day-night cycles, like in Zelda, the the, the N64, they'd have mm -hmm. day-night cycles, but it was like, oh, you know, every 15 minutes, the changes from day to night. And it's like, that's not... That doesn't feel realistic at all. It just feels like a thing you put in there. So yeah. I'm wondering if that also had an effect on it, that they're like, well, you know what? It, it, it feels more like we're in real time if there's no day-night cycle. Yeah, I think that could be part of it, too. I, I just don't think it was feasible to put a day-night cycle in the game, or they just didn't have enough time or something. They, or, they didn't, or they didn't think it mattered that much. Right. You know, well, that's, it's just a choice that's like, if we have to sacrifice... If there's something that doesn't matter, it's a day-night cycle, at least for the purpose yeah. of this game. It's funny, because speaking of yeah. you know, Japanese game design... Yeah, there's a there's a game called Dragon's Dogma, which is like one of those like it's, it's just kind of like a big open world like I've Western fantasy. Or, you, oh, you played through it? Yeah, I beat it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you know, like the day night cycle is a huge deal in Dragon's Dogma. Yeah, because the harder <laughs> enemies come out at night, right? And you can't see. 
<laughs> you always have to have like a torch or a lantern because you can't see shit. That's right, because it's so dark. God, it's been a long time since I've played that game. Dude, my brother is a huge fan of Dragon's Dogma. I just got so frustrated by that game. <laughs> they were supposed to come out. They were supposed to come out with a sequel to it. I'm not surprised because like, I, I, I thought that game was kind of like a cult hit, you know? Yeah, it is. Well, and they released. They have the game itself, and then they released an expansion pack. Yeah, the Dark Arisen. And, yep, and then they had it come out on PC with enhanced features. So, and it's by the guy who did Devil May Cry. So, like huh. Devil, Devil May Cry three, four five like he's the one who like oversaw it and so there's definitely room for like all of the different elements of the game like the whole like shadow of the colossus grabbing on and attacking the beast there's like a lot of elements that can be improved upon and like made mm -hmm. more cohesive but yeah. i mean i i enjoyed it enough i ended up kind of speeding through the end of the game though of dragon's dogma yeah 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 because yeah. it was just it's a it's a lot it like, is a lot, lot of games there's a it's a lot of content D one one more thing because like speaking of shadow of the colossus and like open empty world japanese games one thing that i liked about shadow of the colossus and one thing i like about this is like we talked about there's no daylight day night cycle there aren't any like ambient birds or like anything like that bugs or anything like that except for crypto bites and like i feel like this is a game that worked around its limitations like it had a set thing it had to do they had a certain mm. amount of time that they could get it done feasibly a certain budget and they were able to focus on what they absolutely needed to get done for the game yeah and any other sort of limitations they were able to build around it like mm -hmm. like you know ditch the day night cycle you don't need it it adds to the world of the game um, yeah. not a ditch lot of animals ditch animals they're not going to serve any purpose in the game limit the amount of enemies you face okay well that's good because like we'll make him a guy who doesn't fight people and like yeah. because he doesn't fight people very often like the most most of the game isn't going to be about fighting people it's going to be about movement tech yeah so you don't see a lot of people in person uh weave it into the story it's like a you know it's kind of like a broken world where everyone's in hiding yeah, like, uh, oh, we can't have, like, fully populated towns. Okay, well, we're going to put everyone below town because of something called Timefall, which looks just like rain, but causes, you know, a lot more deterioration. Like, yeah. very smart use of of the, the old uh, working around your limitations. Yeah, they do a good job of kind of working around the limitations, hiding the flaws, um, or at least kind of excusing the flaws. Yeah. So that they're not... Or building flaws into the story. And yeah, it so you, it. yeah so yeah you don't you don't really notice them or they're not they don't bother you the way they might normally that's that's why this game reminded me a lot of shadow of the colossus in the sense of like shadow of the colossus they knew what their main thing was they had a big world and then they didn't have enough processing power or time to put anything in it and they're like fuck it <laughs> except we're lizards. just gonna yeah except lizards and like fruit okay that's fine we're gonna we're gonna we'll we'll work around it and so I always appreciate games that can do that really well. And again, this feels mm -hmm. like Shadow of the Colossus because of the barren world as well. It's like, yeah. it's interesting because you don't play games that have this empty of, uh, feeling very mm -hmm. often. So. Yeah, and it's also like the empty feeling kind of contributes, I think, or at least it contributed to my satisfaction with the later portions of the game where like all this stuff has been built and all that because it's like, mm -hmm. oh, look, the game was empty, but now it's full of things. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, oh, people have been walking around here and they've been traversing it. And, you know, maybe the the other thing was like they have little porters every now and then. They have good mm -hmm. guys walking around. Yeah. Um, and they're like, hey, what's up? Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> oh, that's cool, too. So it's almost like you can feel the effect that you're having on the world as you're building the world, which is mm -hmm. really cool. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a really cool game. So metaphorical, dude. This is so metaphorical. It's the most metaphorical. I know. I feel like, you know, with all this coronavirus shit, I feel like if people get locked down, they should just play Death Stranding. Because <laughs> it's like, it's a very like hopeful game and it's about like coming together in a time of crisis and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's all about connection. <laughs> it's also funny because like the guy who made Metal Gear Solid 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and he makes this like hopeful game about like, reaching out to the world and connecting with people and it's like okay didn't see that coming but i'm down I'm yeah down. which is really yeah which is really interesting given that all the metal gear games are like hyper paranoid conspiracy thrillers <laughs> super depressing <laughs> like <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I dude, Kojima's ama- like he's an amazing game designer. I think he's because he doesn't approach it from like a typical way. Like I mm. think I I follow his Twitter and like in his Twitter account he's like I started with a laptop, a pen, some paper, and an idea, and it became Death Stranding. And like that's super like that's super hopeful and motivational. And I'm sure getting mm. like fired by Konami was like a huge influence on like wow all of those people that i used to work with a lot of them are gone who can i who do i still have connections with who yeah who can i still work with um well i mean you've got buddies at platinum that's true they also make really good games that they do control insanely well like (laughs) vanquish is probably like the best controlling third person shooter i've played in a long time really i yeah i really liked i did like (laughs) revengeance a lot and i like bayonetta a lot I never was able to play Revengeance. I do want to go back and play that because I know you really like it and my brother really likes it. I mean, I like hack and slashes and it's kind of goofy, like mm-hmm. like really goofy. <laughs> and there's like just enough Metal Gear in it. Um, but really the uh, the speed running community for, <laughs> for Revengeance is crazy. But the game itself <laughs> is like, the game itself is like pretty like, it's pretty like metal. Yeah. Not just because he's made of it, but you know. Well, it's a very it's platinum awesome. games game. It is, but it has just enough kojima in it as yeah. well. You know, it's just enough. I think it's fair to say, like, I think Kojima's a genius game developer. I think he's kind of, he's like Steven Soderbergh in the sense that not all his ideas are good, but they're all interesting. <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. I, I would probably put him more in, like, who would, it, who would his equivalent be? Because, like, I... It, not all of his ideas in the games themselves are good, and I would like attribute that to like, oh, there's problems in the script. But like, fundamentally, all of his games are solid. Yeah, like, like I don't, I, I don't dislike any of his games that I've played, and and I really adore the Metal Gear games, especially. Yeah. I mean, who would, who would I? Because he also only he, he like I I he's not quite, but no, I'm not. I, I would, I would, I would have been like, yeah, he's kind of like a Kubrick of game design because he like hits a bunch of different quadrants, and all of his games are like incredibly well done, except for the one that he didn't get to finish. And they all have parts that people won't like, parts mm. that people will like, but he's definitely also left a huge imprint on, on the video game landscape. Yeah, I think. I don't think he's quite as innovative now as he was earlier in his career when his ideas were really radical. Yeah. Um, whereas, like, the Kubrick comparison, I think one of the things with Kubrick is that... He kept... Every every movie he made introduced something new to the language of cinema. Like, it introduced a new technique or a new way of using a technique or something but then just got, like, copied to death. Yeah. Whether it's all his steady cam shots in The Shining, his use of zooms in Barry Lyndon, his um, you know his style of storytelling in 2001: A Space Odyssey, he always seems to be pushing the the boundaries of what film, or at least mainstream film, can do. Whereas yeah. I think Kojima, you know, he obviously like blew the doors open by creating the stealth genre. Yeah. And, you know, has been kind of innovating within that. And I think he wanted to make, he wanted this to be a similar, like, leap forward into the future of game design. And I think it's, I don't think it wasn't that, you know, it's not, it's there not a enough... new genre like he thought, like he wanted it to be, I think. But it's, it does a lot of really interesting things that you don't either, you don't, I haven't seen before or just you don't see very much of or done on this scale, you know? Yeah. Well, that's why I like him too, is because he shows me things that I didn't know that you could do. He's like the Pixar of video game designers. (laughs) Terrible marketing campaigns, but amazing games. (laughs) But yeah, because like, you know, the whole community build the world together Mm -hmm. aspect of this game, it's like, you know, there's other games that kind of do that. Like, I think there's... You know, uh, there's versions of Minecraft where you can build stuff with your friends. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, it's the way he weaves it all together with sort of his very admittedly heavy-handed uh, themes <laughs> Sto- and, and storytelling, <laughs> I think is, is really well done and it's very unusual. 
Because it, it's not a game about like coming together with your friends to do something. It's about it's a game about being alone and connecting with strangers to do something. Like having to take like a leap of faith in that way. And the game does a good job of showing you like, look, if you if you if you take the risk and you commit resources to improving things that may seem like weirdly bizarre, like huge and too big for one person to do, like other people will join you yeah. and together it'll all work out. And I think that's really neat. Yeah, I think so too. Like, and that, I, yeah. Well, I would also say he's got a bunch of aspects. Maybe he's closer to like, well, no, because Scorsese was copied all the time too. <laughs> um I don't know. It's it's weird. it's hard for me to make a film comparison because like it, his games are so kind of off the wall, and he kind of has like an influence, but not necessarily because like his long cutscenes became standard for a while. Everyone started having really long cutscenes in games. Yeah, but they weren't. But they didn't. They weren't like using like gameplay specific or like like game mechanic specific things, which is what I like about Kojima, which is what I think is cool. Like you said about the world. Is like it's a gameplay mechanic specific thing that also has an effect on the world, and it doesn't quite make sense mm -hmm. in the world, but it also does make sense in a weird way. And I think that's okay. I think it's okay to have like a little bit of like, well, this makes it more convenient for the player, and we don't have to explain exactly why it works, but it does work. Yeah, Logically. that's really interesting actually, because he was kind of the first guy as well. Like his other big innovation, besides kind of creating the stealth genre, was. Uh, making games cinematic and his use mm -hmm. of cutscenes because then you know it's like everyone's been comparing games to movies ever since he started doing that yeah to the point where you know the new god of war is just an interactive movie <laughs> <laughs> is that any is that game any good everyone I've keeps heard telling it's me really it's amazing good. yeah I've, a lot of people have told me it's great but i was never a big fan of the original like hack and slash god of war yeah. And this game seems so pretentious that I just can't get into it. Because like every every review is like the whole game is in one long take. It's like okay, Alfonso Cuarón, go fuck yourself. Yeah, <laughs> that's how that's how I felt too. Like maybe, oh god, maybe we should just dive in and play it and see. Because a lot of people are like, oh, it's amazing, and the twist is amazing. And I've played through God of War one, two, and three, so I know the story. I don't like the story. I think the games are. They're decent, but they're they have like serious mechanical problems, and like yeah. they're just like they're not. They're kind of like every reason I hate American action games. <laughs> well, it's <laughs> funny because the story of the original God of War games was like moronic, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I get, and it's weird because like in that first game, which has kind of set the pace for all three of the main God of War games, it's like the whole game is to get the MacGuffin to fight the final boss. Like if Kratos's mission is. I need to kill Ares. Mm -hmm. The whole game is a MacGuffin to get it. Like the whole game is I need to get this item, which will allow me to get this other item to kill Ares. Yeah. Which is dumb. Yeah. <laughs> like no, I, the, the whole, all the games are just jacked. Dude is angry. Must kill. Go. <laughs> exactly. And like, and again, the best parts of those games are the platforming sections because mm -hmm. the combat is not particularly deep or complex, which I don't mm. like. Like I, that's why I, cause I loved the, the Ninja Gaiden for Xbox. And then for, I enjoyed Ninja Gaiden two as well. Ninja Gaiden <laughs> three was horrible, but like the <laughs> mechanics in those games are like super solid. There's a lot of like there's a lot of little things you have to learn that can assist you in the game. Whereas with God of War, it's like, you can literally use square, square, triangle to get through the entire game. And yeah. no matter how many times they tried to get out of doing that, there was just another combo that was like another square, square, triangle that you could use. Two was well, the best, but... God of War, I think, seems to reflect its era whenever it's being made. Because it's like, you know, at that time, it was like an age of Devil May Cry ripoff games. Like... Yeah. Like, I remember the Ghost Rider game that was, like, a tie-in to the Nicolas Cage movie was just a Devil May Cry ripoff. So there was a lot of that stuff floating around, and so God of War was an, yeah, another one that was in that style. And I guess yeah. now we're in the age of, like, Uncharted 4 and The Last of Us 2 being these, like, prestige games that everyone fawns over. So it's like, all right, well, what if we made God of War into Uncharted? 
that's that's and that's the other thing because god of war's big innovation was these like big set piece moments of like quick time events yeah and so it like at least had one <clears throat> thing that was original and then everyone copied it and those events got ridiculous mm-hmm. and so then they're just like it, it just i mean shit, again even star wars I, the force unleashed was a fucking devil may cry ripoff yep 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 it was where you had to, where like he could take down a star destroyer, but every time you went to a door, you had to do this like little mini game to force it open. Like <laughs> you had to what? mash the circle button to open it. Like yeah, it's like can't he just <clears throat> blow the door open with his force powers? He took down a star destroyer. <laughs> like that was where I was like, that's I didn't realize it at the time, but the game's dissonance. Uh, that's what I found out that that was what I was having a problem with. But yeah, this new, the new God of War that came out looked just so derivative of everything that I was like, uh, I don't know if I want to play it. Yeah. But. I mean, that's kind of where I'm at with a lot of video games. It's, you know, I just kind of follow, I just, I'll get new entries of series that I really like and just can't get tired of. Like, I'll never get tired of Borderlands. If they make a Borderlands 4, <laughs> I will buy it and I will play the whole thing just because I love that gameplay loop. And how just silly it is. Um, <laughs> That's actually, it's incredible that you're a fan of Borderlands. I know a lot of people who really like the way Borderlands plays. Yeah, it's a, it's a ton of fun. Um, or like, you know, I got The Outer Worlds because that game looks like a blast. And it's kind of like, you know, I like the Fallout type games. And this looks like mm-hmm. Fallout with all of the Bethesda clunkiness. <laughs> um, hopefully, so we'll see how that goes. And then, pretty, basically, anything Kojima does, I will at least give it a try because, yeah, like I said, he's never not interesting, yeah. and he's always he's really ambitious. Like he's always trying to do something crazy, and I feel like you know this isn't necessarily something crazy, but it's pretty different. Uh, it's pretty <clears throat> crazy. I mean, it is like it gets a lot of flack for being a walking simulator, mm-hmm. and like it is, but it's like if you had. A walking simulator made by the guy who has made some of the best controlling action games ever, like focusing singularly on making sure he does one thing almost perfectly. Mm-hmm. So, and and on top of that, it's like like you said, the part no one talks about is the network play, which is incredible. And yeah, and the fact that the game continues to build on top of itself, whereas other games might not build on top of themselves. I think is really cool. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really great the way the world does evolve as you progress through the game. Yeah. Whereas, you know, most open world games, it's like, go to this area, complete this arc of the story, go to this other area, complete this other arc of the story. Like, the world isn't continually changing with you as you, as you do stuff. I mean, some yeah. games do that, but most do not. Yeah. And, and, and at least not to the degree that this game does. Yeah. For sure. Because it's not like a set progressive thing. It's like, oh, well, you unlock this and we're going to dot a bunch of random shit in it. <laughs> so, I mean, it's but it's cool because it's always going to be different mm-hmm. for whoever you're playing with. So, yeah, yeah, I I mean, I, I like it a lot. I'd probably give it a witness overall or like a or like a low shiny in Chrome just because I know that a lot of people just because it, it drags a little bit and the two in the three quarters mark. Yeah. And because, like, a, a lot of people will not be able to have fun with it, I think. I think a lot of people will not have the attention span to put in the time to, like, get it. And I think also the fact that it's so heavy-handed, mm-hmm. in, or it, it, like, front-loads all of this really weird stuff. Like, did you know Kojima's a fan of film? This is Die Hardman! Did you know that, <laughs> you know, like, like, oh, did you know he was a fan of film? Here's Guillermo del Toro playing Dead Man. Like, I think a lot of that will turn a lot of people off initially, yeah. but if they stick with it, I think it's ultimately really worth it. Yeah, definitely that. I think I would give it a solid shiny in Chrome just because I really loved it, but it is major pacing issues, which is going to frustrate a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and it frustrated me to a degree. It definitely frustrated me near the end. And I, again, I still think it's one of the best games I've played. In a while, although I did like Assassin's Creed Odyssey a lot, or <laughs> Assassin's Creed Origins, I actually liked that a lot. That was a lot of fun. But again, those are the. It's weird because like the Assassin's Creed people have also got like a bit of Kojima in them, which mm-hmm. I like. Assassin's Creed is an interesting franchise because I remember the first game was like such a neat idea, but it was just like, it felt like it was they weren't able to follow it through all the way to the end. It just sort of felt like limited, you know. 
In the first one, yeah. Yeah, and then Assassin's Creed 2 was incredible. Assassin's Creed Brotherhood was even better. And then I, since then, I felt like it's all just gone to shit. They have no idea what they're doing. I, they, keep, they keep radically changing everything about the game each time, and it becomes more and more nonsensical. I wonder if it's a running joke, like Revolver Ocelot's Allegiance. <laughs> like, just nothing that makes the, sense now. That, the meta narrative in the game is just like a mess. Um, so it, it's like I really I heard that. So Unity is supposed to be awful um, because it had a ton of bugs. Syndicate's mm-hmm. supposed to be pretty good, and then I think they took like a year off. And Origins completely changed the gameplay style, so it's more RPG like. Yeah, and which I thought was weird. It's it's actually a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, part of what I liked about Assassin's Creed is that it's not RPG like. The like, first it's an one. Open world, the first few, like Assassin's Creed 1, 2, they two started, and a half, 2 and 3 quarters, and 3. With, with like, 2, three they started introducing more. RPG elements. A little bit, but not really. Like, you can buy shit, but that's it. Yeah. You know, well, to increase it, yeah. But I use the same But, like, there's no leveling up. Them. There's no, like, oh, here's a new skill. There's yeah. no skill trees, which I find annoying. I think I think a big beef I have with a lot of modern game development is they throw in like skill trees and RPG elements where they're not needed to beef up a game that would otherwise be kind of empty. You know, it's like there's not like yeah. this game doesn't have as much stuff in it, so we're just going to add a skill tree where you have to invest in swinging a sword or whatever. Whereas like you know, Assassin's Creed and Assassin's Creed Two, you could do everything. It's just a matter yeah, of, like, yeah. at a certain point in the story, you acquire a new tool for a story purpose, and then you can use it for the rest of the game. Yeah, which is kind of like Death Stranding. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like Death Stranding. Yeah, because I don't want to have to spend skill points on, like, shooting a bow or something. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I can understand that. Or, like, buying a new bow to, like, do this or that. Like, I, I get it, and it's... When we talk about derivative series, like, Assassin's Creed is definitely a series that is based in that after the first game had an incredible like gameplay foundation mm-hmm. everything since then has just been like taking derivative elements of other games and putting yeah it in. and it's weird how they've done it too like how the combat's changed like assassin's creed one and two the combat's very defensive so everything's mm-hmm. counter-attacking and then assassin's right. creed brotherhood onward they're like well we want to make it more offensive based so you're not just having to counterattack everybody which i thought was cool and it opened up some cool new possibilities and then unity comes along and they're like well you know it's your character's too overpowered now so we're gonna have to scale them back and then by doing that it's like it's like we're gonna make it like dark souls where the combat's really grinding and slow and you know every enemy can one shot you but also the game's incredibly glitchy (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and Uni- that's why that's why they said the the PC port of Unity is really good because they they there's like a day one patch that's or there's a patch that as soon as you get it it fixes all of the glitching issues. Yeah, but I, I, I but I don't I don't I'll I'll skip Unity. I, but yeah, I it's haven't like, heard anything good about it. Neither have I. I mean, I played a little bit of Unity and it it sucked. But after that point, I I kind of wrote the series off. I mean, I didn't even finish Assassin's Creed three because I yeah. got bored. Because everything was so on rails in that game. The nice thing about the the first few games is like, I I like the fact that you could go after the target. Like once you had a target, you could go after them almost at any time. But like you were rewarded for doing all the side missions where you like collect information and like you get like maps and yeah, patrol yeah. patterns and mm-hmm. things like that. So you could plan it more carefully. And it's yeah. weird because those games like the stealth was really bad. So it's weird to have like Assassin's Creed where you can't sneak. <laughs> you're just running around like a maniac but well, like that's, having yeah. all that information and gathering all those clues and things like helps you at least direct you're running around like a maniac in a more yeah. purposeful and targeted way it, well and it was cool because there's always there were at least in two there were multiple ways to approach an assassination i know that in brotherhood they ran into a problem where it was a little bit too linear with your assassinations so they mm-hmm. op- they tried to find ways to open it up in other games, and it's nice because um, there's a little bit more of like, oh yeah, you can directly assassinate someone in Origins, but no, it's it's it is a lot of like, there's not a lot of opportunities to assassinate characters mm-hmm. as much as as much as there were in like you know two and three, and I I liked how in two, like you were saying like, oh yeah, but you can't really sneak around. 
I like the fact that the game was all about sneaking around in plain sight. Like, I yeah. thought that was a cool concept. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you're right. It's funny because the game came out and, like, at the time they were like, oh, I don't know, it's too repetitive. And now we call that repetitive the gameplay loop. And, like, it actually <laughs> has a really good gameplay loop that they never have done anything with since, like, Assassin's Creed uh the the revelations <laughs> although i'm so glad they got rid of the fucking tower defense mini game from assassin's creed revelations I yeah that. i lost every single one of those i know those are so bad <laughs> it was so like there's a way to do tower defense like it was perfected in 2d don't <laughs> exactly. try and add a third dimension that makes it worse don't do it um <laughs> but i think a lot of people were actually happy when they did away with a lot of the boat stuff as well because black mm. flag was like it's like, oh, this is no longer Assassin's Creed, is it? And, like, the idea of, like, working for the Assassins, like, to be an Assassin of, like, oh, freedom is our most important thing. Whereas, like, with the Templars, I guess it's, like, I I wouldn't even be able to tell you. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know. It, it, it went far. It started to spiral far from its roots when half the time you're playing as a person who should actually be a Templar. It's, like, it was getting yeah. weird. Yeah. Like I said, that series just seems to be a huge, a colossal mess. It lost its luster for me a long time ago. Yeah. A lot of a lot of games have trouble jumping generations. They do. Like, which I, is the fact that the fact that Assassin's Creed has somehow survived and have made better games, even if they don't feel like Assassin's Creed, is mm -hmm. still kind of commendable to me. Like I'll, I'll give them credit. But yeah, I don't know. I don't have much else to say about Death Stranding. Neither do I. I think we've said quite a lot. I think so. I know what's going to happen is we're going to be done recording and I'll be like, oh, we should have talked about this aspect of the game. But <laughs> <laughs> but alas, it's, you know, that idea has just been placed in the time fall too long and it's deteriorated to nothing. <laughs> to awkwardly, like, lump in some of the game, the something about the game there. Well, I, I, as that wraps it up, I guess uh, we should say make sure to... Uh, download us and subscribe to us on itunes and mm -hmm. stitcher yes uh our website is under the wheels dot wicksite dot com slash blog yeah hopefully we'll see if that continues to be updated um <laughs> you can email us at under the wheels podcast at gmail.com do we have anything else do we have anything else we need to plug we don't have an instagram or twitter no we don't which is probably for the best yeah. <laughs> maybe it's maybe a twitter to get the word out there um something i haven't done in a while i wanted to thank mike for the music that we've yeah, been using you, for mike. like for like six or seven episodes now and never mm -hmm. given him credit except for the first time so you know what we mike could do is uh we could set up like our own under the wheels chiral network but instead of chiral <laughs> stuff it's toilet paper <laughs> <laughs> it's a toilet paper distribution network <laughs> The toilet paper distro center. <laughs> just we'll have just get... porters who run around we'll... with like babies strapped to them. <laughs> we'll get we'll toilet get... paper to people. We'll get Mike to be a repatriate. <laughs> just load him up with toilet paper. Have him run from city to city in the United Cities. <laughs> the United Cities of Orange County. Just like watch out for those mules. They want to take your toilet paper, and they're all covered in shit. I know. I can just imagine the real-world Amelie's like, Sam, I need to wipe my hole again. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, bring me the level two wet naps. I need those. Yeah, you get the level one wet naps when you connect uh, a doomsday prepper, and then if you three-star their location, you get level two wet naps that are also antibacterial. <laughs> Like every now and then they're going to be like, oh, this is fragile merchandise. It's triple ply. You like, have, oh God. You have Purell grenades that you throw at uh, people <laughs> with coronavirus. <laughs> every now and then someone orders a bidet. You have to keep it flat. <laughs> fragile merchandise. Oh my instead of, God. Instead of timefall shelters, you have coronavirus shelters. They're like just giant bidets. <laughs> giant bidets with like actual like hand washing stations and stuff like as you're doing it like, oh we didn't even talk about the odorex scanner oh my god oh, oh yeah, well. yeah yeah <laughs> that oh tells you god. how hard it is to walk in a straight line <laughs> no i i use the living shit out of the odorex scanner i thought it was i know brilliant. <laughs> i used it, it constantly was, that was such a kojima -y thing too i was like oh this is cool 
Um, but yeah, we need to get we need to get uh, we need to get uh, Mike an Odorex scanner so that he can scan around and make sure that there's no coronavirus on the floor and no yeah. shit anywhere. <laughs> Hook him up to or a that baby that can sense over the, the particles. <laughs> 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 it's like, oh, that fence. Oh, nope, that's a bunch of red X's. Oh, but that fence. Oh, that's that's orange ones. You can climb that one easily. <laughs> Go ahead, use that one. Okay. And we'll have to communicate with everyone via hologram because no one's leaving their house. Yeah, exactly. And and even though they have like a network of like, you know what? It, it's funny because they have like, oh well, no, he had codec. I was gonna say it's like they don't have phones, but but he has codec. So. I know they brought back the Metal Gear codex. Yeah, I know. I loved it's interesting it. how there's a lot of game like Metal Gear ish gameplay elements in this, like the codec, um, like all of the equipment. It's all uh, white outlines, like in the Metal mm-hmm. Gear games, with like descriptions on all the features and how to use them that are usually so long you have to scroll down <laughs> any tiny little window that shows up. Instead of having someone explain it to you, like, oh, this is an A24 Magnum shotgun. It uses this type of rounds that are made from this kind of steel. The round is direct injected in and, and pushed <laughs> forward by a spring mechanism. Uh, oh, I God, remember that. when you would just get, like, a handgun in Metal Gear Solid 2 and then Otacon would explain the fuck out of it, like, any of it mattered? No, dude, in, in, uh, the, first, in the first Metal Gear Solid game, it was McDonald Miller... Who sounded oddly like salt, like Liquid Snake? I oh, know. Hey, it's that's Socom uh, gun. Kazuhira Master McDonald Miller is a, <laughs> is a very important character in Phantom Pain, by the way. <laughs> I I've heard. Well, it's also it was also funny that Johnny Sasaki like they like they had to bridge the gap between like the Japanese version of Metal Gear Solid and the American, so they mm. kept calling him Akiba, which was his name in <laughs> Japanese. And so Kazuhiro <laughs> McDonald Miller. <laughs> McDonald Master Miller. <laughs> McDonald Master Miller. Oh, God. Oh, God. All right, but God yeah. what's, what's the full list of Ocelot's nicknames? I don't know. It's I only like... know him as, like, oh, oh, man. Like, Special Forces Gru Operative um, Revolver Ocelot Revolver. Ocelot. Yeah, he's. It's like it's like Revolver Ocelot, aka Ocelot, aka Shalashaska, aka Adam, aka <laughs> Adamska, <laughs> Adamska, aka <laughs> Major I, Ocelot, aka it's Liquid all Ocelot. <laughs> oh God, Liquid Ocelot, brother. Oh. Who's affiliated, uh, and his allegiances are to Foxhound, the Patriots, the Gru, KGB, and CIA as a free agent, Outer Heaven, and the Diamond Dogs. Oh my god. So he has, he has like eight names, he's part of eight conflicting organizations. <laughs> <laughs> he has like three different voice actors. <laughs> yep. Cult, the cult single action army, the greatest handgun ever made. made. <laughs> um, fuck. Oh, the Odorex Ganner codec. Oh, the other thing that I wish, it's like we were done talking about Death Stranding. The only other problem I had with Death Stranding is usually Kojima's games, you can like manipulate the fuck out of cutscenes by like zooming in and shit. Yeah. You couldn't really do that in this, but anytime it was on a menu, you could put your finger on the button, on the large mm-hmm. button. And rotate your controller and see the whole 3D imaging. And you could even huh. do it on codec calls. I was like, yes! That's cool. So anyway. I know in Metal Gear Solid Five, you can't manipulate the cutscenes very much either. Because a lot of them are um, like very select camera angles and stuff. So, Oh, so they, wouldn't, they don't let you like zoom in and stuff? No. Like not in the actual cutscenes. There's like kind of in-betweener like in-engine cutscenes, you know? Yeah. And those you can manipulate a little bit, but like the okay. um, the actual cinematic cutscenes you cannot. So like you can't do what you did in Metal Gear Solid 2 where if you pulled like one of the if you pulled like triangle or uh, if you press triangle in Metal Gear Solid 3, you can like zoom in and like ro- you don't rotate the camera around, but like you can like move the camera box and stuff a little bit. You can't Not do that. Really. I don't think so. Uh, yeah, because <laughs> you have to appreciate Kojima's like whirling dervish camera work, yeah. <laughs> where it's like weird handheld floaty spinning around stuff. The, the like, 
the like I'm trying like when it, when uh, Metal Gear Solid Four came out and like the camera was all like dusty and stuff and they're like and like handheld because they couldn't do that in Metal Gear Solid Three they're like yeah. look at how realistic and now he's like I watched I watched Children of Men I can do that camera <laughs> angle in in a game like yep whatever man fuck yeah because the camera work in uh, Phantom Pain is very similar to the camera work in Death Stranding. Yeah. The only difference is I think the, the camera moves more in Phantom Pain. I can like see it's that. more acrobatic. Uh, yeah, I can see that. Well, because my friend showed me like uh, Ground Zeroes and he was like, mm. oh yeah, here, I'll beat it in like five minutes. And so he was going through and doing it and I was like looking at the camera work and I was like, is this supposed to like seem like it's all one shot with like Kiefer Sutherland like awkwardly trying to do his best David Hater? <laughs> I've arrived here, Colonel. Like it's not it's not the same. Yeah, should have brought should have brought back David Hater. He should have. Well, Kojima's been trying to fire David Hater forever. Cause David didn't David Hater have to re audition for like Snake Eater and Guns of the Patriots? I I wouldn't be surprised because David Hater would have been brought in by the American voice directors. Mm-hmm. So, but it's just so weird. Like everyone likes David Hayter as Snake. Yeah. Like it's such a strange. Like why? I don't understand why. He, like, I don't understand why Kojima hates him so much. Well, so there's a. I don't know either. Although there's. What's having, the rumor? Well, no. It's just I was gonna say having Snake again. This may be some Kojima syndrome, but if you play Phantom Pain all the way to the end, there is kind of. There's a way you could explain having Kiefer Sutherland voice Snake in that game, right? But that doesn't make sense for Ground Zero. I mean, you don't have it to doesn't. spoil it. It's it, it's been spoiled for me. Oh, okay. So you can you can spoil it, but like yeah, I was gonna say, it doesn't explain it for um, for Ground Zeroes. No, unfortunately not. So. <laughs> I think he just doesn't. He's, he doesn't. He, doesn't. he wants someone other than David Hater for some reason. Even though David Hayter's literally in the 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 title sequ- one of the title sequences in Metal Gear Solid Four, I know uh, Kojima. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Yeah, well, Kojima does some strange stuff. He does, but that's part of the reason I love him as a game designer. Yeah, let's be honest. <laughs> he's one. Of, he's one of the most fun game designers ever. Mm-hmm. The fact that he's like a rock star game designer and that people are like confused about that makes me sad. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I think it's kind of like David Lynch. I mean, he's this rock star filmmaker, but a lot of people will see his movies and just go, what the fuck? But that's the fun. <laughs> that's part of the fun. <laughs> if I wanted something like normal and boring and ordinary, I'd watch like, you know, McGee's movies. Like, I don't need to see, I don't need to see like amateur hour on every movie. If you're going to do something different, like make sure you go all the way and do it cool, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. McG, I haven't heard that name in a long time. I know. I feel bad beating up on the guy. I actually, because like I actually <laughs> genuinely enjoyed when I saw it. Charlie's Angels Full Throttle and like Terminator Salvation isn't like the biggest piece of shit on the planet. It's not great, but it's not like the worst thing ever. There's a picture of Stanley dressed as Revolver Ocelot, and it's like almost perfect. <laughs> like, man, talk about missing out on <coughs> cameo appearances. I know. Special units, Foxhound, Revolver, Ocelot, true believer. (laughs) Uh, I also like how the final boss battle with Higgs ends up with, like, that really awkward, like, old man (laughs) beatdown that you get at the end of uh, Metal Gear Solid 4, where it's like they're both having heart attacks, but you have to, like, punch each other, and it's... Again, everything about Metal Gear Solid 4 is so excessive and overly long. Like the final fist fight with Liquid Ocelot That's is so like worth 20 it. minutes. It goes through, like he keeps changing through the different phases of how his character uh, is in each game. Yes. And like it's or playing all the theme the, music all, from each yeah. game. Oh. And they're like throwing their back out and like coughing. And they're just like. Because they're both old guys. They're both old. And then at the end, like you can only throw one punch every like two seconds. So it's just this sort of agonizingly slow, like. Bam. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> Bam. 
<laughs> it's just like, oh and my goodness. It's like everyone w looked at that game and they saw how to incorporate gameplay into cutscenes, and mm. that's all they got from it. And they didn't understand, <laughs> like, as a tool, why that would be a good idea or why that wouldn't be. Mm. And so then, like, we had a bunch of, like, copycat games where, like, the final boss is, like, you know, like, you're just standing there and it's, like, the, the quick time prompt button is just flashing in your face. It's like... Can I can I just let time elapse or oh okay I have to push the button I'm like they didn't understand <laughs> maybe like, I can wait for Liquid Ocelot to die of old age yeah <laughs> <laughs> you just leave it sitting there and like Snake dies because it's like because he gets a heart attack or something <laughs> well, but like it, it's like people don't yeah yeah it's like people look at his games and they don't take away the things that are like actually cool. Mm -hmm. And just the things that they're like, oh yeah, maybe that'll maybe that'll work. It's like no, the 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 first aid stuff in Metal Gear Solid Three is awesome. I liked that. I'm trying to remember that because I, I do remember it was like kind of complicated. Yeah, like you would have uh, you like if you got injured, you could go into the first aid menu and like there were things like splints and mm -hmm. and rolls of like gauze and stuff that you'd apply. Um, and it was cool because Metal Gear Solid 3, like, even though it took place in the past, it had more <laughs> complex gameplay systems to, refle to reflect the fact that, like, rations couldn't just heal you magically. It's like, yeah. oh, nope. In the real world, you, we didn't have anything that, that was that uh, technologically advanced. So they used more technology to create a world that had less technology. I know. More it's accurately. weird that, like, Konami made this awful bullshit multiplayer game called Metal Gear Survive. When yeah, Snake Eater was the real Metal Gear Survive. <laughs> it was. <laughs> it, well, then, and Metal Gear Survive, like, I was almost tempted to play it to see if it had the same gameplay feel as Metal Gear Solid, but with, like, MMO-type elements. But I was just like, nah, it just looks awful. Well, because isn't just it so just depressing. like a shoot-em-up? It's like, like a, a, zombie, it's a shoot -em -up? zombie game. Yeah, yeah, I think it's like a yeah. zombie shoot-em-up game with the Metal <laughs> it done in the Fox engine. That's so stupid. Yeah. So is the Fox Engine Konami's property now? Yeah, I believe so. Oh, if it, that if sucks. It, that's why Death Stranding was made with the same engine that made Horizon Zero Dawn, which I never yeah. played. Well, because I remember Kojima spent years building the Fox Engine. <laughs> the first version of it was Metal Gear Solid 4, I believe. So he's yeah. been spending that long. That was like the first iteration, and then... And then Metal Gear Solid Rising was supposed to be on it, but... Yeah, it was supposed the, to be, like, the completed Fox engine or whatever. But but the game moved too slowly. The Fox engine was, like, Old Man Snake, and they needed, like... <laughs> that's why they gave it to Platinum, and Platinum was like, yeah, we're just gonna do it with our own internal engine. It's, yeah. it's fine. Well, I remember with Metal Gear Rising, the initial promise was, it was like, you can cut through anything Everything, in the world. Yeah. And that ended up, like, destroying the game, because they didn't know how to, like, make it feasible... So right. they handed it to Platinum, and Platinum's like, "Okay, we're just gonna make a Platinum game. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna include the element, kind of, but but not fully. But like kind you of. can't cut down buildings and shit with your not sword. anymore, no. But <laughs> but like the the demos of Metal Gear Solid Rising look so cool. They made it, yeah. They made it look like it was gonna be the the greatest game ever. It's unfortunate, but it just it never it, came it was out. not feasible. It couldn't have. Been it would have been like Katamari Damat. Katamari Damasai or Damachi, if you're American. Katamari Damachi? Like, Katamari Damachi, dude. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but yeah, Damachi, like, is game. it Italian? <laughs> Katamari Damachi, yeah. Damachi. Uh, well, no, it wouldn't be Italian anymore. <laughs> oh, coronavirus. Bruh. Um. That's low. <laughs> that was a low blow. Hey, man, the, the, little, the little guy sucked up everything. I've actually never played through... A single one of those games like i hear they're really fun but i've never actually played through the whole game or even tried it out really hmm. i know I'm, I, I should because i like weird games <laughs> apparently <laughs> i was gonna say i feel like yeah i feel like you would have at least tried a game like that i was thinking about it but at the but i would every time i would try to pull the trigger i was like eh, nah nah well maybe some other time <laughs> yeah, so yeah even though the game's been out for like four months now, go buy Death Stranding and play it. <laughs> <laughs> Any last thoughts? Nah, man. Death Stranding's awesome. It is. It's so fucking cool. Well, my well, that uh, I don't even remember how we end these things anymore. Neither do I. We already ended it, and then like it was like a false ending. 
I know it was. Well, I'm not going to go back and be like, oh, you need to subscribe to here and here and here. No, you know what? We do that once, all right? We're not yeah. some YouTube channel that's <laughs> desperate for likes. We don't even have brand sponsorship yet. <clears throat> Hideo wow. Kojima. Um, <laughs> we're sponsored by monster energy <laughs> and ride and with norman I... Ritas. <laughs> norman Ritas comes on the podcast he's like uh you guys are pretty good are you guys gonna ever do walking dead sometime like nope i don't know can we shake your hand or are you gonna like flinch <laughs> it's like i'm not actually sam porter bridges man hey man um, follow sam porter bridges's lead practice social distancing <laughs> <laughs> practice social distancing until all of the bts are wiped out and then mm. we'll connect together in the chiro network also uh crypto bites do not cure the coronavirus they do not they give you stamina they give you blood but they will not <laughs> purify your blood <laughs> they replenish your blood <laughs> i need more blood give me crypto bites i love that they, they're just like everywhere and you can have 999 of them and like in the middle of battle sam's just like chewing on crypto bites yeah i know and in like, the middle of like all those uh clifford unger boss battles yeah. i would like hide behind a crypto bite like colony just, and just like eat them <laughs> oh. oh man well we just threw death stranding under the wheels i guess i guess Death Stranding's awesome, go buy it. I'm Matthew. I'm Gabe. And you've just been under the wheels. My We're brother was at Costco trying to get some um, some baby Toilet wipes. Paper. Oh no, god. Because his girlfriend has like a newborn younger sister. I think it's yeah, I, newborn younger sister. So, I thought that was gonna go in a completely different direction. No 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 no. no. Um, so like her, his girlfriend's dad was like, "Hey, can you guys like run out and find some baby wipes? Like, cause we can't find any." Right. So he was going to Costco, and he was saying like, you know, there are people like, you know, how Costco has like the party steaks, where it's like I'm doing like a Sunday church cookout, and yeah. I need to buy all the steaks for all of the church people in one go. Yeah. Like people, like everyone was buying those. And he's like, yeah. you're not going to eat all that fucking steak unless you freeze it. Which and then I just started do, thinking, yeah. it's like, I just started thinking, it's like, this is turning into the lighthouse. They're all just going to fuck the steaks. <laughs> 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 They're going to get coronavirus and just like, kind of like rub it all over themselves. <laughs> They're all going to be farting up a storm, and if they don't have any toilet paper, they're going to have to go back to using fucking, uh, fucking pans to shit in. I was going to say, like, if oh I run God. out of toilet paper and there's nothing in the stores, I'm going to start playing the most dangerous game. Just hunt people for their toilet paper. <laughs> I saw something that's like, you know, if you need 40 rolls of toilet paper to last you through two weeks, you should have seen a doctor a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i mean it's true if i'm able to stay healthy i'll be uh i'll be the next sam porter bridges <laughs> strand <laughs> metaphor name <laughs> gabriel <laughs> linked rope uh, i'll be uh gabriel tunnel. stick rope paper <laughs> <laughs> stick rope toilet paper <laughs> <laughs> Carabiner, <laughs> fucking rope bridge, <laughs> dude. Fuck you. Like when it gets to the end, and Cliff is talking about how his name is also a metaphor. I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ, man. Finished. <laughs>